Nostar Pabonin, or Mittendar Thiso. Uh, welcome everyone to my talk. Um, I'm actually really honored to be opening this conference here today. Uh, so obviously I wanna just thank a few people before I start, obviously Scans for running this event again um, after a couple of years. Um, and it re really honors me to be able to start presenting what I have been working on for the past uh, year and a half or so, just, uh, you know, on and off. Um, I want to present to you today the first steps I've taken towards producing a new grammar of the Middle Cornish language. Um, I believe that everyone here should have most of the background knowledge, so you will forgive me if I skip past where Cornwall is and a lot of other things that usually go at the start of this talk, just to really get stuck into the meat of what I've been doing over the past couple of years. I'd also like to thank my supervisors, Stephen Morey and Maria Tabain, uh, without whom I certainly couldn't be here. Um, Stephen Morey, some of you may know as one of the bards hailing over from Australia. Going through today, I just want to do a, give you a little bit of background on myself and what I have been looking into. The place of historical Cornish research, partly in juxtaposition as to why we would look at the historical versions or historical forms of the language as opposed to the modern living form, as well as some of the pedagogical issues that we that arise when we do study the historical forms. I mean, it's a bit of a, not much of a jump. It's been said for, since, you know, the invention of the computer that there's a lot of work and a lot of power that uh, these programs can actually give us when we look at the Middle Cornish language and what they actually bring to the table, as well as what I've done and where I hope to go to from here. So this research was born out of my honours, which was in 2017. And for that research, I looked at the mutation system of the Middle Cornish texts and how applicable they were to the modern rules. I was using uh, Weller Brown's uh, Grammar of Modern Cornish. That was the most up-to-date grammar I could find. Uh, and it was well known that the mutation system in the historical periods of Cornish was not internally consistent with itself, nor was it consistent with the modern grammars, but I couldn't find any information really to show me what that inconsistency was, exactly where things were different, how the language had changed over 400 years, uh, except for what Caradar wrote in Corner Simplified Part 2, which I've just attached there. In this work, what I did was I took a section of Bionin's K, um, which was discovered in 2002, so actually post the discovery of it post-dated uh, the Weller-Brown grammars, and I analysed the rules of that Weller Brown laid forth and the Bionin's K text or 500 lines of it in the Arthurian section. What came out of that was that of the 55 mutations that I looked for, only 14 were in complete agreement with a handbook of modern Cornish. Uh, a lot of them simply weren't there, uh, but 19, which is more than the ones that agreed, disagreed with a handbook of modern Cornish in at least two locations. And in some cases, there was quite a regularity in those mutations that were missing. So what came from this uh, was the idea that even though I was, had only been looking at a relatively small part of the grammar, the mutation system, uh, there would likely be inconsistencies further within the language. This is not uh, going to be shocking for anyone. I think obviously 400 years of language change is going to cause changes, but I really wanted to see how the language worked uh, at the period where the, some of the more important texts were being written. And I should say right now at the start that my work is not designed to reflect any attitude towards modern Cornish or find out which parts of the modern language have historical roots. It's more that it gets harder and harder to understand the historical forms the further we get away from them. So I really want to look at creating tools to help a new reader or a new uh, learner be able to read the historical texts.
there is obviously some struggle here on why we would study historical Cornish as opposed to why we would study the modern language, as many people are. Um, and one of, some of the reasons I lay forth here, uh, the modern Cornish language owes as much of its modern form to its historical forms. Now, this is naturally true in all languages, but the closeness of modern Cornish and historical Cornish is really multifaceted, and there's a lot more going on here. Uh, there's the missing years where the language was not being used as a major community language. There was a specific rollback in the early 20th, 20th century, particularly by Nance and Karadar, uh, talking about rolling back uh, and basing the modern language on the Middle Cornish period. Um, so there was a lot of late features deliberately taken out or what was seen at the time as features of late Cornish. Uh, and there's also a lot of, I guess, online in particular, it's here in the text mentality. And I'm well aware that me sitting here talking about what's in the historical text has me fall into that camp. Um, but what I'm hoping to address is we don't know exactly what's in the historical text. Uh, so I'm really starting to look at those in depth. And the historical texts are not solved. There are many questions remaining about their purpose, their content, and I believe that this information is available and accessible in these texts, uh, given enough, obviously, time and effort. Studying the historical forms of the language are going to give us better tools to understand those and any potentially future unearthed texts, which I believe Oliver Padel will be speaking on a little bit later in the session. And also, it, knowing what was there beforehand is going to help us a lot when we start looking at the language revival more closely, what has been deemed important, what has been cast aside, and then we can use these lessons for other languages worldwide, as well as obviously exploring the traditional texts with uh, digital programs. Uh, there are some pedagogical issues um, that I've identified and tried hard to work around, but also affect um, the study of historical Cornish at all. Uh, since the beginning of the revival, and particularly since the introduction of Cayman in the 80s, uh, the Cornish language has had to straddle an ever-widening divide, the fixed language of its history and the evolving modern language. And this is not a bad thing. Nobody's arguing that we should be using you know, unstandardized middle corner spellings, but any standardized standardization by its very nature is locking people out from being able to read these historical texts. And modern grammars and dictionaries must and should focus on the modern language and the information is unreliably marked for neologisms. And it's a bit weird saying neologism and saying anything in the, you know, a 400 year period uh, is new, but uh, they're not in, not reliably marked for uh, innovation. And the Middle Cornish period itself has only received one published grammar in Llewellyn Cernwig Canal uh, by Lewis in 1953. And my personal communication with other scholars in the area have indicated that even a direct translation of um, uh, the book does not match what we know about the language. I mean, it is tiny. You can get through it in an afternoon. Uh, a German translation was made in 1990 and Laura and Turians began work on a Middle Cornish grammar in the late 1990s. However, that was never completed. And both of these grammars and obviously the original uh, predate Bjornan's case. So there's a whole nother text worth of information that we can try and understand. And so the revival process has been quite a snowball. Uh, where the first grammars were based on the late Cornish period and then the rollback to the middle Cornish period for some. Uh, grammars in the early revival period were all based on the work of the previous person. So there are cases uh, that we can look at where we can say things like errors were propagated across time and we don't know exactly which of these have made it into the modern language and which of these um, there is evidence for. Like I said, I'm not trying to talk about the modern language, just specifically things said about the Middle Cornish period. And obviously all the innovation that's happened has created this real whirlwind, uh, making a language that's not dissimilar to the Middle Cornish language. Uh, but there are, 
there is sufficient um, distinctness from that period. And then obviously there's the complication of orthography and standardization. Uh, as I said, any standardization is going to uh, limit one's ability to read the historical texts in their historical spellings. Um, and again, it's another area where we're not sure where errors may have been propagated, where texts are constantly being updated to a new orthography all through the 20th century. We do now have obviously have access to modern computing equipments and programs, and these are going to allow us to have much greater access to the manuscripts. Those who are interested, you can find a number of the manuscripts available online. Um, and obviously, once they've been digitized properly and stored properly, they're available for anyone to use. We also have access to programs that allow us greater search functionality, more in-depth automated statistical analysis, and those sorts of things to really allow us to dig deep into these texts. So that's a bit of a background on what I, where I started, or what have I actually done? Uh, first of all, I went to collate the existing digital copies of the Middle Cornish texts, that is the texts as far as I could get in the historical spelling, trying to get as much as I could a one for one between the historical text and these digital files. This currently sits at at least a single copy of each of the Middle Cornish texts. It doesn't take into account those texts where there are multiple versions. I've just been able to get at least one and was quite a trial to get to that. Some of these digital copies are, I will admit, not fantastic. Um, a lot of them have been digitized from the era of punch cards or extended binary coded decimal interchange code. And so while these digital copies purport to be truer renditions of the historical texts, they're not true digital copies. And some texts are not scanned. We don't have digital, co digital pictorial copies of them, so we can't actually assess the accuracy as much as possible uh, that to the level that we would like. And I really must put out a great thank, thank you to Andrew Hawke, whose work in the 1980s was responsible for most of the digital versions I was able to get access to. Lara Turians and Ken George as well were for their willingness to supply me with digital copies of a couple of hard to find files as well. And like I said, some of these uh, uh, OCR, at least one of them is OCR from Whitley Stokes's material um, from the 1850s. So you can see there's definitely going to be um, room to improve these. But that's where I started. I collated uh, digital copies of the texts. And then I put them into a program called Fieldworks uh, Language Explorer or Flex. It's a program designed to handle linguistic data similar to Toolbox for those who are familiar with that. It accepts our digital copies of the text and has tools to help with the interlinearization, morphological analysis and dictionary creation. One of the cool things about it that really uh, dragged me towards using Flex was a smart recognition feature. As long as you have put a word and meaning for a particular form uh, for any word, it will automatically search the rest of the all of the text to find that exact form and will uh, suggest it going forward. So it doesn't work well with words that have a lot of different meanings, but it, specific phrases like if you've got something that's repeated over and over, or even just something small like spit of sons, Holy Spirit, these can be run past quite quickly. And it also allows us to look at our da data from a number of different angles, allowing the creation of dictionaries and things like that much more easily. So this is what I started with up the top, my original transcription. Uh, this is the ninth, eighth and ninth line of the 11th Trigia homily, um, De Sacramento Altara, the sacrament of the altar. Uh, each text is then analyzed on a word by word basis, just to mark it for part of speech and a transliteration of the text to English. So we can see there or being just a participle particle and not being like a, uh, word. Here some choices did have to be made. Uh, you can see there that I've put Emma together for the boss form. Uh, 
dangling prepositions and dangling us just like uh, are was versus are was. These have all been marked to look at at a later date, um, but for the most part, they've just been put together for this particular stage. And this was used to create a literal translation line. Uh, so copied word for word, we can see there Emma uh, being B. And if you go to the literal translation line, it's B, participle particle, say. Not really helpful uh, in a lot of cases, uh, for someone trying to read it, but we can, it helps for putting the grammar together. Uh, I then moved and did a free translation line. This free translation line was done using a variety of different tools. Um, obviously, from what I can read there, I've also looked at other translations, for example, for the Bionans K, which I started with. I had both Ken George's and Willie and William's books uh, on those. Um, so I was able to translate it using those. Most of the anal analyzed texts were able to be transliterated in the first run. Obviously there were words here and there that didn't have a definition or we couldn't find it in the first run. So we will be going over this again. And the texts were passed using a variety of different materials. So uh, unified came in SWF translations, uh, English translations, and a lot of different dictionaries. So that's why you, when you look at that, you might find uh, a number of different orthographic, uh, different number of orthographies there. This methodology does have its issues that it is semicircular in nature using the modern tools to look back at the historical form, um, but there was not really a better way for me to do it at the time. And so from this point, each word was connected back to a dictionary form. Uh, the number of dictionaries, as I said, were various, so this hasn't been standardized. Um, this is similar to the second process um, talked about in Mill's computer-assisted lemmatization of the Cornish text for lexico lexicographical purposes. And whilst the primary purpose of this process is very similar to Mill's work, uh, it's, there are some significant changes, which meant that I wasn't able to directly import that work. Uh, but the idea of using a base lemma is providing a background structure. And currently this has been done for both the Miracle Plays, the Ordinalia, Passion of Our Lord, and the Trigia homilies. Originally, I had not included the Trigia homilies, but discussions with a few colleagues indicated that, you know, there were a number of reasons to include them. And I am glad that I have, though if they do in the end turn out to be just a little bit too different, I can always cut them and do them separately. And the plan is for, so that's what I've done thus far. And the plan is now to use this corpus to build a grammar of the middle Cornish period reflective of the text that I've used and use that to create tools specific to inquiry into the middle Cornish period. In essence, I want to translate and update uh, Liver Kernowig Canal into the 21st century. Flex also allows us to do a number of different things. Uh, this is example, for example, is what comes out straight away compared against Verbo Kernowig by Ray Edwards. Uh, so I've got the boss, I've got my spelling variants, I've got all of the mutated forms. Uh, there's lots of things there and all in all, we actually have probably most of the boss forms just there. Uh, total numbers uh, that I've gone through, now these might be a little bit out of date, is that I've transcribed 135,000 words. Uh, to put that into perspective, Lord of the Rings Return of the King is 137,000 words. Uh, that may, that's made up of 14,837 unique words and 4,023 head words. And they've all grown substantially in the last year or so. Beyond providing the basis for the upcoming grammar, the Flex database has been invaluable for a number of different functions. I can pull out all examples of any given spelling, any given morpheme, any given lexical grammatical info. Here is one of my pages that I've brought out just of the invariants. And it's been useful on a much more casual level as well. Um, 
answering questions on Facebook regarding usage of words in Middle Cornish, the ability to summon every example of a particular word in minutes is incredibly valuable. And going, going forward, I hope this can provide the basis for a Middle Cornish dictionary as well, which I've said before. Ideally, I'd also like to finish collating uh, digital images and scans of the available texts and to organize the scanning of those texts which are not available. This is something that I had planned to do uh, during this year. Uh, I had planned to go to National Library of Wales and British State Library and all that. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, this year turned out the way it did and I've been stuck in Australia. I have had got a number of texts, uh, but unfortunately I'm not able to currently find digitized or publicly available copies of Grianz and Bis, uh, the Trichia homilies, various ordinalias, various Passion of Our Lords, uh, and yeah. I will say that um, Williams, Everson and Kent's Charter Fragment and Passion of Our Lord uh, did come out this year, so I have been able to get those, but I don't have the digital copies. Because I do think also that there's a lot of information hidden in these texts that is not available to me just with my notepad digital files. Um, here's just one example here. We've got Hasevis in uh, written down there in the red circle, written in Bjornan's K. And it's a long S, which I never would have expected given the digital copy that I had. And there are lots of various letter forms that are shown throughout um, the text that I do have access to. Uh, actually studying the text, I believe, will also um, be full of like rich metatextual analysis. And to my knowledge, there's not actually been an analysis of this kind utilizing multiple texts uh, other than, as I said, the Charter Fragment and Pascon Agan Aloth uh, by Williams, Everson and Kent. Um, but I would like to see something on that uh, happen in future if possible. Uh, my plan was originally to also include a from the page style thing linking the analysis or at least the word and part of speech uh, to those original texts. Uh, this is an example of a German letter written in 1880. This is just an image taken from the from the page website. Uh, but this is something that I'd really like to see also happen in the Cornish language space. Uh, but unfortunately, this has been delayed due to the factors I talked about before, and I'm probably not going to have time to be able to finish this in the next year or so, which I had hoped to be able to at least start on. Because I truly think that the best work when looking at the historical text can be done when we have both the various transcriptions available to us, and we're also able to refer back to the original text. So where do I want to go from here? I need to go back and redo all the analysis again. Obviously the things I started with right at the start are of a lesser quality than the what I got to by the time I was finishing the Trigia homilies. Uh, so I do want to go through that. The verbal conjugation system as well is very difficult for uh, this program to understand because there are just so many options uh, and there's not a great way of filing them in that uh, particular, in Flex's system. So it may be worth just doing them separately um, and not particularly in that program. I want to speak to the libraries regarding the remaining unscanned manuscripts and begin the process of digitizing them. Ideally, check these past texts against the original manuscripts for consistency, see where all these changes are, and use the past text to complete the grammatical analysis uh, with a strong focus on sentence structure and the permissible constructions. Miras, thank you very much. And that was my talk. I did want to make some introductory remarks about um, digital technologies as part of language revitalization, uh, because this is where we're coming from uh, in the language technologies unit at Bangor. We're not involved in uh, any of this work for historic reasons, but we do believe that having um, digital language resources in our languages will help 
Welsh, Cornish, uh, other Celtic languages and all uh, minority languages to, to prosper in the digital world. So um, going back to September 2018, there was quite a revolutionary resolution passed in the European Parliament for digital language equality in Europe. And that for the first time included not just uh, state languages, but regional languages, minority languages. And since then, that has led to um, a European Commission call for language um, equality. Uh, it was published earlier this year to create a, 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 an agenda and a roadmap for digital language equality in Europe. Um, and with, with the um, ambitious aim to do away with digital language extinction by the year 2030. And I think that's even more ambitious than um, the Welsh government's uh, aim to have a million Welsh speakers by 2050. So we've given ourselves in Wales until 2050. Uh, the European Commission has given themselves until 2030 to do away with digital language extinction for all European languages and that includes Cornish. So that is the background to um, our involvement in this field. And um, we've, we've been working primarily uh, with Welsh, but also having regard to other minority languages and particularly um, Celtic languages. So I was very happy a couple of years ago to meet Mark Trevethan. Uh, I think it was at the Celtic Knot conference in, in Edinburgh and to see where there were some synergies in our work and we, where we could come in and use some of the technology we'd pre previously developed for Welsh uh, to help Cornish. So I'm going to slip over this slide because I really want to go on and show you uh, sort of um, tools that we have that have helped Welsh and which we've adapted for Cornish. So this is called Mice Tea. It's um, a dictionary uh, creation and maintenance system. We developed it in, initially for Welsh terminology because we have been standardising a number of uh, Welsh terminology dictionaries for education in Wales. And what we found was that we were working in a paper-based environment. I was sending out, posting seven or eight draft copies to experts, receiving them back by post if I was lucky. I couldn't understand the scribbles and the comments very often because of the bad handwriting, saying nothing but my colleagues there. And it was very laborious anyway to collate them all and put them into a computer system. So I thought, wouldn't it be great if we had the system, we could all log in online and work together and all our um, experts uh, in various locations can join us and work on this dictionary together. And believe you me, with a COVID crisis, this is the best thing ever because none of us can go to our offices. Uh, we're all um, stuck at home and we have a dispersed team working on it. Um, and this uh, system enables us to work. What you can see there and what the um, editor, any editor who can use the system, who has um, a, a password to um, access uh, any of these dictionaries, they have that um, uh, scrolling down the list of, of terms, you can search for the one you're interested, the entry you want to use. But note especially here on the left hand side there, those uh, mainly blue uh, round buttons with a white tick in them. If that button is blue and there's a tick there, that means that entry is simultaneously published online in our um, terminology um, dictionaries or online portal. It will see that one entry there down the bottom uh, doesn't have a blue button, it has a red circle with a cross in it. <clears throat> that means that that particular entry isn't published. So it means that either we're still working on it or we've unpublished it because uh, of a certain problem. So this is the back end, Mice T is the back end of the system and I'll be showing you the um, online uh, dictionary public version in a minute but just to show you what happens if we go into an entry we've clicked on an entry now it's the entry for tree in it, this happens to be the um, terminology dictionary for Welsh schools so this is used for the national curriculum in the schools of Wales 
and you can see across there because it was um, intended for terminology standardization work you have tabs for four um, different stages of the work stage one you collate the terms stage two you define the concepts stage three you standardize your terms and it's only in stage four at the end there that you do your linguistic work and um, maybe some of you who can understand Welsh will see that we've input the part of now uh, part of speech it's a noun and um, the gender it's a feminine noun and <clears throat> the plural form there are other empty boxes down the bottom there for um, uh, example sentences if we use those or for um, usage notes that's a new feature which we're beginning to find very useful in some of our work but that's a sort of quite a simple and neat way that we guide the um, editors through the standardization or through the dictionary writing experience now this is the published face. This is, uh, in this case, the Welsh National Terminology Portal. It has over 20 of our dictionaries in it. Um, some of the dictionaries have their own website as well. So from MICE-T, you can publish to many different formats. We use it as well to manage um, some of the dictionary databases for dictionary apps and for offline formats as well. But this is the main um, uh, main portal that we use and you can see a very simple search interface there I've just typed in the word tree so then you click search and let's see what happens here are some of the results we've had for tree from many different uh, dictionaries here you see a uh, the school dictionary one at the top together with a, an archaeological uh, dictionary and then underneath there are some um, dictionaries from the uh, Colleg Cymraeg, that's the Welsh National uh, College, Welsh Medium Teaching across all the Welsh universities. And in those dictionaries we have um, definitions as well, el elaborated definitions. And right down at the bottom there you'll see tree in graph theory, which is another totally different concept. And you can see that some of the um, words there are in red underlined in, in the definition. You can click on those and they take you through to another entry where that term is the header word. And then you can um, look at that term in context as well. So that's what we did for Welsh. How did we adapt this work for Cornish? Now this is um, one of the pages from the Cornish uh, version of Mice T. Um, so it's, it's not a, a, in our database, it's, I, we can't access this system. Well Dewi, who's our lead uh, software engineer, who's actually designed this system can, but I had to ask him to make a screen grab for me of the dictionary. But you can see it's very similar to the first one we saw of the Welsh Mice T, with the interesting addition of those little round purple buttons now with a, um, a microphone um, uh, icon in them. And that's because we have a new facility here. Don't think it's been much used yet, but that will enable uh, participants to record um, sentences or, or words being spoken. And that will enable us to move forward with what I, with Cornish speech technology as we are doing at the present time with Welsh. So this is an expandable system at times goes on, um, technology moves on, we can um, expand the system and add new features to it. So in this slide we've moved, uh, we've clicked on uh, one of the entries, it happens to be the entry on trees again to compare this with the, uh, the similar uh, entry for tree uh, in the Welsh um, mice tea. Um, I've clicked again on step four, the linguistic information, but you will see here that it's far richer than the equivalent uh, Welsh version, because what we've done here is adapt the system to some of the uh, new pieces of information that our Cornish colleagues wanted to include. So um, the two main ones really are that facility to uh, state is it a middle or a late form of Cornish and also some extra um, parts of speech that they, um, this 
in this instance it's a collective noun now we don't use um collective nouns as a part of speech in our modern um welsh dictionaries you do find it in the historic ones but it wasn't needed in our work and um at the bottom there there's a facility to put examples i guess that's the same as our example sentences and the translation as well uh, and there are different fields there for uh, pronunciation, late pronunciation, late plurals as well, context mutation and so on. So these derive from the um, Cornish need and what was already um, noted in the Cornish database, because I must uh, emphasize we've only been working on the um, uh, the, the database side of it, not, not on, the, on the platform, not on the content. The content has been supplied to us by Mark and his Cornwall Council team and by the Academy Kernovic. So what we've done is to provide a container, if you will, that will um, include all that information. So um, you saw that the um, um, Welsh terminology portal with that sort of red banner at the top. This is the equivalent one for the Cornish dictionary for the Gerlifer Kernewek. Um, so this is the front end of what we saw in MICE-T because the public don't see MICE-T. What the public sees if that little uh, blue button is clicked is this. So again it has a, um, a very simple uh, interface. You have a prominent box in the middle there where you can type in the word you're looking for either in Cornish or in English. It will be able to um, pick up which language you want and uh, give you a result accordingly. So I've looked for the word, word cheese and uh, it's found three entries and you have the first one there curse and it looks very much like the uh, what you'd find in our Welsh dictionaries the noun the part of speech and the plural form if we scroll down in that entry we'll see um, cheese as part of a longer term or a longer phrase so you it's picked up on processed cheese but cheese is at the end of the um, the string and on and the other one of cheese press press where you find cheese in the middle so so far so much like um, the results you'd find um, in a Welsh uh, dictionary. Let's go into a more um, intricate um, record here. Um, we are again looking at the entry of trees. Now you saw trees in mice tea and you saw the way that that could um, accommodate the need to show the middle and the late forms. Well, if you can um, see on your screen here, you have the M after gwydd and the uh, gwydd after the L, little late form. And you can also see that they are both um, uh, collective nouns. So again, something that we didn't have in the, the Welsh dictionaries, but accommodated to show them clearly in, um, in an online environment. And we hope that that is something nice and user friendly for people who aren't necessarily language experts, but they can um, uh, use this dictionary easily and change uh, directions. I should have said that as well. You click on the uh, other language and it's the dictionary refers, um, reverses directions. L lots of nice little uh, features there for you. And as well, all the different types of trees uh, running down the bottom of the page there. So let's look at another entry here, which um, is a deceptively simple one, actually. I was looking for uh, sheep, davas, thinking that it would be a simple one to show you. But of course, if you look further down the page, what you have are some more examples of, the, um, of um, sheep being used in different terms. But now you have especially the two plants there, sheep's bit scabious and sheep's sorrel, which come from your um, uh, terminology dictionary from your flowers uh, word list. And there it has the Latin names and also the Welsh names. So you have additional information here. Now the Latin scientific names can be used as a sort of key to enter that international world of other 
um, scientific terminology in the same field. So if I just scroll down a little bit more in that entry, you can now see that there's an image of this plant here. There's a picture. And this is, I think, one of the nicest things that's happened to our terminology dictionaries in recent uh, years. Uh, a colleague, well, I think it was again Dewi Bryn Jones, my, my colleague who does the, um, uh, the technical and uh, the uh, coding work on this, he noticed that uh, we could use that Latin term to access um, uh, Wiki, Wikimedia, Wiki Commons, uh, and to use their extensive database of images or photographs there. Uh, and to hook them into our dictionaries. Now, these aren't added laboriously by hand. We'd never be able to manage to do that. It's done by adding a line of code. And if I can show you the equivalent entry in one of our Welsh dictionaries, there you have it. So it's the same image. I've managed to put a mouse over here so you can see the little white box at the moment running across there, which says it's a CC0 license, which is a permissive open source <laughs> license. It allows you to integrate you, uh, these images into your own work at um, no cost, and you don't even have to um, acknowledge the work. But you can see at the very bottom of the screen as well, the um, acknowledgement to commonswikimedia.org. Um, that's again is a mouse of, over to show you where that little file comes from. And when this was run over our uh, plant dictionaries, our dictionaries were instantly turned into colourful encyclopedias with all this nice new uh, pictures there. And it's a very simple way um, to enrich the data uh, in a, um, a dictionary for a, a minority language. Okay, so I think this is uh, quite new for uh, all of you that uh, you won't have seen these statistics of use before. But I asked Dewi, I think it was only yesterday, I asked him to do this, uh, if he could go into the system for me and see how well this dictionary, this online Gerlever Kevnawek was being used. Um, and sorry, the um, names of the months at the bottom there are in Welsh. So um, they start off at June 2019. That's when the dictionary was um, launched. So you can see during the first um, week or two of the launch, it very quickly climbed to over 50,000 uses uh, per month. Uh, these statistics run from month to month down to uh, the end of September um, last month now. So you can see that it's um, at its height it's received over well nearly 80,000 hits per month and I think that's doing amazingly well for a, a small minority language. It's dipped a bit during July and August I think that might be due to the summer holidays. We've found this for our dictionaries as well, that they aren't as heavily used um, during the holidays. Obviously, they're not light uh, holiday reading. But I think it does give you confidence that th this dictionary is being heavily used. And um, I can show you as well uh, the top six countries uh, where these inquiries are coming from. Um, maybe it's no surprise that England is at the top of the list there. This is for a, um, a random um, monthly uh, search, I think, of a monthly time period. So you have England at the top there, the USA second, uh, and we know there are lots of um, people uh, interested in the Celtic languages in the States. Wales surprisingly in third place, but again, I think there's a lot of interest in the Cornish language in Wales also. And Cornwall in fourth place, but I think that's due to um, the different numbers in, in population as well. Um, Japan makes a surprising entry in fifth place there. That was quite unexpected. Um, so, we, but, but we do know again that there's a lot of interest in, um, in Celtic languages in Japan. And then Australia in sixth 
place and maybe we've found the um, answer to why there's um, such a lot of searches going on in Australia after Joshua's uh, presentation this morning. So after these top six countries, of course, you have searches from all sorts of other countries included, but it's a long tail and there was no um, uh, obvious seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth places. But these searches, again, um, we, we'd love to analyze them in greater detail. But if you want to see that just uh, as a pictorial representation, that strong blue there is England. Um, the States is the orange, Wales is the grey, Cornwall is the yellow, Japan the light blue and Australia the uh, green. Uh, I should emphasise that doesn't add up to 100%, those are just the uh, top six languages, but they do make up a sizeable portion of the searches that we have. Okay, so we are going to turn our attention now to the Cornish corpus and as Mark was saying um, as he introduced me, this is quite a recent development. It's only uh, online since the middle uh, of August and I'm not sure how much attention or publicity it's um, re received so far. But um, in regards to language revitalization, I think next to a dictionary, it is one of the most important basic electronic resources for a language. So I was delighted again with Joshua's talk and the work that he's doing with um, a corpus of Middle Cornish. Um, I should emphasize that, okay, a, a, a dictionary is quite a basic resource for everybody in the general public. If you just go on your holiday to Cornwall, you will want that Cornish dictionary, you will want it to, to um, look at some basic Cornish words and so on. Um, cor a corpus is maybe a bit more uh, specialised, but having said that, with our sort of easy to use interface, we've been surprised with our Welsh corpus portal, how much use it does get well, from people who are learning Welsh as a second language and also from translators, especially. And our interest in parallel text corpora certainly was that they can be easily built up from translation memories and can be used to create machine translations. And I don't think that we're that far away from a Cornish system if we can use, say, um, a parallel text corpus of uh, the Bible in say uh, one of the varieties of Cornish and, um, uh, and an English parallel uh, text. So that's something for the future, but we have been uh, playing around with this for Welsh and having um, quite a bit of success in doing this. So the corpus that I'll be showing you in a minute uh, really is, um, uh, uh, it, it's derived from a translation memory uh, of uh, the uh, translators for Cornwall Council. So it's good quality uh, modern Cornish. Uh, it's not a historical corpus in any way, um, but it was furnished to us in, um, as an um, uh, output from the translation memory. Uh, and I'll be showing some um, examples in a minute, but we'll turn to the Welsh National Corporate Portal first. You can see from the banner at the top there, that's, uh, it's the same sort of idiom as our national terminology portal. Um, it, it's, uh, we haven't dedicated a great deal of resources to this. It initially came about with a request from um, a Russian um, academic who wanted to look at an older Welsh corpus we had, the original Keg corpus, which is a million Welsh words which was created um, in uh, the early 1990s and incidentally which we had to rescue from a computer which was going, being thrown in the, into the bin so I uh, sympathise very much with uh, Joshua's experience if he has found that there was uh, some corpora up on the website which were subsequently lost because in the early days especially that could happen very easily and it could yet happen because of lack of resources for our Celtic languages. There's a lack of sustainability um, when projects are being elaborated and so, so 
part of the reason to create for creating this portal was to save um, some uh, corpora that would have been lost otherwise, uh, but also to make them more accessible and more easily searchable online. So we have um, four corpora in this searchable format. Um, and I haven't taken a screen grab uh, for this, but if you go to this website and scroll further down, there are some links there to some other uh, Welsh corpora that aren't online. Some of them have their own websites and you can um, click on a link of the um, early modern corpus of Welsh. And I think there's now there's a medieval corpus of Welsh in there as well. And maybe again, looking at Joshua's work, that's um, something that could be developed on your Cornish um, corpora, uh, corpus website as well, just to add some links in to draw attention to other corpora, which maybe you don't have the right to put on online and or aren't in the right format to put online. But it's good to have a one stop shop where you can show all your corpora together or list them together. So uh, what I'm going to show you now very quickly is the proceedings of the uh, National Assembly of Wales Corpus. Um, so I'm typing into the, um, uh, the search engine here, the, the little box again. Uh, you can see how we've derived this search facility from the dictionary searches, but you do have to specify your um, uh, language here. It's not one where you can type in in either language as you can in the dictionaries. So here I've typed in the English word economy and let's see what results we get. Okay, it states that the uh, source language is English and the target language is Welsh and it's found me 99 um, uh, examples of the word economy. Now the the reason we've taken the, um, the uh, proceedings of the Welsh Assembly um, uh, proceedings is that it's available bilingually in English and in Welsh. Um, wow. Not as tidily as this, I must say, because what you have is the original language uh, wow. on the left and the translation on the right. So um, if somebody spoke in English, it would be translated in the Welsh, into Welsh. If somebody spoke in Welsh, it would be translated into English. So the target language side was a mixture of both languages and we had to tidy that up until we got this tidy little table showing you always uh, English on the left and Welsh on the right, if you were looking and um, searching on the English language side. So you can see these are results that have been brought up for um, economy. And you can see the sentence now, the segment, as we say about um, translation memories anyway, you have the equivalent segment in both languages. And this helps, as I said, people who are learning the language, you can use it as a way to find example sentences. And you can also um, use it if you're a translator to find good ways of translating things from one language to the other. We've also used it to build up a machine translation engine of Welsh and it's been very um, successful. It's a very um, standard form of Welsh. It's a quite high form of spoken Welsh. I think they've relaxed their language register a bit in the, uh, in, in the Welsh Parliament now. In the old days, um, they used to edit the proceedings to a higher register. Um, that wasn't uh, popular with the uh, members of the Welsh Senev, so they've relaxed it. But this uh, dates back to that period where, where it was very heavily edited, so it is quite a high register of Welsh. Um, and here we have what we've done now for um, Cornish. So you can see this is a similar public-facing uh, corpus portal it um, uh, corresponds to the one that you saw for Welsh with that purple um, banner heading uh, and it, uh, it looks quite different but it really is the same uh, platform behind it. It's just some nice pieces of branding 
uh, an identity here and you of course can carry through that um, family resemblance to the Cornish dictionary as well. So once again you have that big um, box in the middle there where you type in uh, the word or the term you're searching for and you can do that either uh, for Cornish or for English. So again I've typed, typed in the word economy and uh, to my surprise you had 61 examples of it in your corpus. Now I don't have the exact figures here so please don't ask me at the end how uh, large these uh, corpora are because I don't know the uh, answer to that but I'm aware that the Welsh ones are significantly bigger than the um, Cornish one and yet um, for this sort of uh, discourse obviously um, because I think it derives from Cornwall Council and obviously you spend a lot of time in Cornwall Council talking about the economy uh, I guess as we do in, in Wales so again you have these entries with economy picked out in bold and the equivalent um, Cornish sentence so you can see at once how this can be um, a very useful tool for uh, users to uh, access and to have some example stand, uh, sentences and um, uh, equivalences in both languages. And again, as I said, um, this is uh, the work of the translators of uh, Cornwall Council and it is a good standard modern Cornish. It's not somewhere where Josh would go and find examples of his uh, middle Cornish because um, we, we, do, we do this is something we do for the Welsh corpora as well we try and um, keep like with like which is why we have different corpora in there for for different pur purposes so you can also look at the language register or different use of vocabulary or whatever you want um, uh, according to the research that you're doing. And here's an example now where we've switched language direction. Now we've been uh, searching for a term in Cornish and the one I chose with was Torn Yaseth. Please excuse my Cornish pronunciation, but I know that that's the equivalent of tourism. So here it has found 14 results and um, you can see that tourism is included in the equivalent uh, English um, sentences. I can see down there that there is a doubler leisure and tourism is in twice and you might find that with the sort of common phrases or headings or titles that occur um, often in a, a, a translation memory. We haven't done uh, any exercise to try and do away with the doublers and you might want to do that if you were doing another exercise to count the frequency of, of specific terms but that's not really um, the, the reason for this corpus. It, this is a simple to use interface that is accessible hopefully for a lot of people. Okay, so I haven't um, gone through um, either um, website in, in great detail um, because uh, for one thing I was a bit nervous of trying to do a live demo um, on the um, on screen this morning. Um, but I think it's up to you to go and uh, look at these websites in, in greater detail for uh, yourselves to, to see if they are useful at all for you in, in the sort of environment you work and I guess play in as well. But um, our uh, experience has been that um, these cross-lingual partnerships working from Wales and Cornwall together are really a great help to smaller or for smaller language communities and they really um, they make us feel better I think as two small languages uh, working together uh, and there are economies of scale as well and we can benefit in Wales also from some new ideas that come our way from Cornwall such as that requirement to have the speech, speech button included in the MICE-T system and we can also uh, build on these resources to uh, create further tools such as our dictionary apps 
about translation technologies, speak, speech technologies, that you don't go to have to go back to your starting point to zero every time and build up new resources, but these are building new stuff on your existing technologies. Um, also, I think it's uh, important to state that um, we want to empower the Cornish language community to build up their expertise to do this for themselves. I've seen lots of other universities that have parachuted into language communities, had a grant to do a piece of work, then left, and I don't think it's much use to that community. But um, I was very much um, encouraged by the way that we uh, were able to work together with Mark and Sam and, and Cornwall Council, Murras for that uh, partnership, David Trithui as well, who helped a lot to put the, um, uh, the data in a format where it could be imported into MICE-T. And all the members of the Academy Kernewek and all our other language friends in Cornwall for their help and their encouragement in this world work. So I leave you with the references. Um, some of the uh, things I've talked about, they have websites. Uh, that's um, par parliamentary resolution, really important, I think, and the call that's gone out subsequently. And then the um, we, we did present a paper earlier on this year in LREC, which you can read more about the backgrounds to developing the dictionary, especially. And then the Lover Kernewek and the Corpus Kernewek themselves. So there we have it. I leave you there. Now, I'm talking about uh, two, but two verbs here, uh, pizzy and pretty, however one wishes to pronounce them. And we start off looking at the verbal noun, and we see that in Little Cornish, there were four different forms for each of these. And the, this was recognised by Nance, and I have here a facsimile of the entries for his 1938 dictionary, where he shows quite clearly pizzy, pidgey, and also pezzy and pedgy, and likewise for grizzy. Now, most of us know this, but the problem is why should this be and what should we do about it? So let's see why we have these four forms. If we look back at the etymology of these two verbs, it, we, it appears that the verb to beg or to pray comes from Latin, petu, whereas the one for to leave comes from Celtic. But they each have an E here as the first vowel. They both result in four forms in Middle Cornish for the verbal noun. In Breton, only the E form exists, Hedi and Kredi, but in Middle Breton we notice that the, the stress vowel was raised. And in Welsh we have just the E form. So if we look to see how these verbal nouns developed, starting off in the with the supposed forms here in Britonic, pedima and kredima. And if we apply all the known changes, we eventually end up with, in Old Cornish, pidi and kredi. And the most important of these changes is internal eye affection, dated about 700 AD, whereby the stressed vowel Pedi was raised to Pidi. So the supposed only forms in Old Cornish would have been Pidi and Cridi. We then go on from Old Cornish. We find there is a split. The D is abrogated to Z, so we get Pidzi and Cridzi. And then the Afrikaner form z changed either to j, spelt g usually in Middle Cornish, 
on to a Z sign, Z, spelled S normally. So we have these separate forms, either Pidgey and Pridgey, or Pizzy and Quizzy, and subsequently the A sound was lowered to A. So we get Pidgey lowered to Pidgey, Pizzy lowered to Pizzy. All of these four forms exist in Middle Cornish. These on the right are later than these on the left. And this lowering of A to A is very well known. We have, for example, Gwethen lowered to Gwethen. Now, if we check on how these verbal nouns are spelt in the different texts, we find the following table. And those which are more important, I have marked in bold. We find, for example, that in Passio Christi and Resurrectio Domini, the Pidgey, Pridgey forms dominate. In Origo Mundi, there is a mixture. In Passionagan Arlet, they favour Pesi. Humans marry as it. BMA, A stands for Rodolphus Tom's work, whereas BMB stands for the revised form of the first 10 pages by an unknown scribe. Not much data there, but what data there is suggests that the scribe B favoured Pizzi, whereas the Rodolphus Tom favoured Pesi and Crazy. The Bulanske favours Pegi and Crazy. And so on. So if we see which texts favour which forms, we find Pizzi in the rewritten part of Gunas Mariazzi, Pigi in Passio Christi Resurrectio Domini, and so on. And it's quite remarkable. It's not often that Cornish material produces such a clear result as this. And even in late Cornish, we find all four forms. Pizzi and Crizzy are represented here in Slui. Pidgey, Piers and Tonkin, and so on. We also do find in late Cornish the, a, a tendency to substitute the more common verbal noun ending a. So we find pizza in Slui and kredja however that's pronounced, in John Boson. But we certainly find all four forms in late corner. I now want to go on to look at the verbal paradigms which these four different verbal nouns may have. And firstly, we look at the endings of verbal paradigms in Middle Cornish. And here we have the seven tenses, which I have labelled in Roman numbers from one to seven. And here we have the different persons, singular one, two, and three, plural one, two, and three, and also in person. These are very well known in any textbook. I have written them here as they were written in Middle Cornish. And I have divided them here into different groups by colouring. The those which are shaded pink are high front vowels and they are treated differently in paradigms from other vowels here. And two of them of course have no vowel ending at all. Pis, Pris, the uh, third singular, Miabis, there's no ending. And also the imperative, praise them, believe me, there is no ending. So they have to be treated separately. So we have three different categories of endings in these verbal paradigms, and indeed in any verbal paradigm. 
So let's look now at a different case. Let's look at the first singular present indicative, which is not followed by a high, high vowel. And because of that, it does not get raised. If you go through all these changes of sound, starting off from the supposed pedami, I pray, predami, I believe, in Britonic, then we end up in Middle Cornish with peza and preza. There is no mechanism which would raise these to pisa and preza, other than analogy. And I'm not including analogy in these pictures. Similarly, if we look at the development of those two forms which have no ending, mere vids, I pray, and kris them, believe me, then the ending in Britonic is believed to be eat, eat. That disappears completely, uh, and we, going through this procedure, end up with is, because there uh, is a change here in final I affection, the final it changes the e to it. And so we come through to pis and cris, which eventually will be lowered, just like the word bis, meaning world, was lowered to bes by the time of Old Cornish, you will get lowering from pis to pes and cris to cris. And I'm trying here to summarize all these different processes. The high front vowels are affected by internal eye affection, changing from e to e, and they may be changed by lowering. The other vowels are not affected by affection, so we always get s. And we don't get edge either, because the other vowels are not high enough to provoke palatalization. So we only get S. And the no ending, we get is, because in the end, you don't get palatalization at the end of a word, you get only a sibilation. So for the other vowels and the no ending paradigm, we get just S or is, just one possibility. Whereas for the high front vowels, we can get all four. Pizzy, pidgy, pezzy, and pedgy. And the same remark applies to other entries in the paradigm. And here I write out the paradigm showing all the possibilities in the root. Some of them have only one, as, always as if there's only one apart from the impersonal, which is separate. But some of them, like the plural, like the first person plural present indicative, has four possibilities. And so does most, much of the imperfect, and so on. So we can now develop four different paradigms based on the four different verbal nouns. If we take pissy, crizzy, then we find that this will be the paradigm that you would get if you apply all these changes in order. And the entries in green here are those which correspond to the verbal noun. Pissy, crizzy here, Pisis crisis here. And we find that 40 out of the 92 different entries here, that's 43%, correspond to pisi crisi, but the others do not. I've also taken the precaution of putting stars against all the, all the forms which are actually not found. Hardly any of them are found. So this is very much a theoretical paradigm. 
However, bear in mind that if we're going to use these verbs, which are quite common verbs, in modern writing, then we need a paradigm for all different forms. The one for pity and cringy is even more complicated because the pink values here are those where there is no change. That is to say, those which use pinch, pg, pigis, pigin, and so on. Whereas the green forms are, have only assimilation, physis, prisis. And all the white forms, which are the same in all the paradigms, because there is only one form, they are all pez, peasants, sometimes doubled, of course. So this is a very complicated paradigm. If you want to use Pidgey and Pidgey, and you want to apply all the rules correctly, then it would be very difficult to learn this particular paradigm, I would suggest. So what do the actual texts look like? We have these diff four different verbal nouns in different texts. What do the rest of the paradigm look like for each of these texts? So if we look at Passio Christi and Resurrexio Domini, which we've seen use Pidgey and Pidgey, then these are the only forms in those texts which are attested. Most of them are blank. So how well do they actually fit what we would expect, the theoretical paradigm values? Well, those are indicated uh, with no highlighting. So we would expect Pidgey, Pidgey, if we want to say I pray or I believe, we would expect Peza and Creza. And we actually do find that. But we actually also find Pisa and Krisa because there is a measure of remodeling to the verbal noun. We find here pigeon, we pray, fits pigeon. That's what pigeon, that's what you would expect. But in other cases, for example, here, we find that there is remodeling from a e to e. But there's no remodeling to, to of substituting j or z. There is no remodeling of palatization here. So the fit is reasonably good, but it could be better. Now let's look at the theoretical paradigm based on Pesi crazy. This is by far the easiest because, as you see, all of the entries in the paradigm start with pes or kres, apart from the impersonal, which is a separate tense. I have written pes and kres here rather than the lowered form pes and kres. So that would be the only difference which one would have if we, one wished to base one's paradigm on Pesi and Crazy. A number of texts actually use this form. The first one is Passion Agonale. And again, there are hardly any entries, but those which do exist fit well. We have Pes, but we also have Pes, the lowered form the later lowered form, and Chris, we just have the higher form, Chris, Chris. So the paradigm is almost entirely consistent with theory. The other case is Rodolphus Tom's Genus Mariette. And again, it fits extremely well. Here we have the number of cases when these forms are found. Again, we have one lowered form, credit, which may either be treated as an advanced lowered form 
of gray or a remodeled form on the verbal noun. And I also show you here, for good measure, a theoretical paradigm based on Peggy and Credgy. This, as we've seen, is more complicated. But we do find some texts which use Peggy and Credgy for their verbal noun. Now, if we compare now the theoretical paradigms, we find how many roots agree with the verbal noun in the text. And we find for busy and Crizzy, 43%, Pidgey and Crizzy, 24%, Pezzy and Crazy, which is the easiest form, 96%, Pedgy and Crazy only 24%. And if we look at the number of attested forms, they're all very low. We find Pezzy and Crazy again scores highest. So if we now compare these different four forms, we find that there's insufficient data for Pizzy and Crizzy, some analogical remodeling for Pidgey and Crizzy. Pizzy and Crazy is almost entirely consistent with theory for two texts, but for Tregear, no. Tregear is very often shows different forms. And I think this was because Tregear was a priest who was brought up in the West, in Croan, but actually practiced uh, in, in St. Alan. Uh, and I don't think that the form of Cornish spoken in those two places was the same. And so he would have been familiar with, with different ways in which Cornish was spoken. And so when he writes his homily, he doesn't stick to one particular form of Cornish. Peggy and Craigie, on the other hand, uh, not very good in viewing K. Insufficient data, as one might expect, in Sacrament of the Altar. But uh, creation of the world is entirely consistent with theory, which is interesting. I haven't shown all the examples, but I, I have written out the, the text of this talk in full, uh, which I will let people have. Now, what about revived Cornish now? Well, we've already seen that Nance had all four verbal forms in the 1938. The 1938 dictionary, remember, was both prescriptive and descriptive. But his 1952 English Cornish was more prescriptive, and he uses only Pizzy and Crizzy. If we look at Dick Dendle, we find that he has only the third singular form, and he has Pizzy and Crizzy in every case. Whereas Williams uses Pezzy and Crazy. All editions of the Gare Levermeur follow Nance and use only Pizzy and Crizzy. So if, for example, we look at the paradigms in the book of Verbo Canuic, uh, in Canuic Kemen, we find that Every case is Piz and Chris. Even the uh, impersonal, which cannot possibly be right, because there is no uh, there is no reason why their uh, palatalization or uh, Or the change from D, D to S just didn't occur in, in those cases. And what we find is, if you compare this with the theoretical paradigm for Pissy and Crizzy, all those marked in blue, 59% are analogical. Well, that doesn't really correspond at all to what was actually going on in Middle Cornish, or indeed in Late Cornish. Why should this be? Well, I think the reason is no one had ever thought about this before. I mean, just copying that and going on and then producing a paradigm which seemed to uh, be consistent, but doesn't really correspond at all to the traditional evidence. And if we look 
on the S on the, the Swift online dictionary, we find that we have three of the four forms for to beg, pezzy, pedgy, and pizzy, these two being labeled late and middle. There's no justification for that. All four forms occurred in both middle and late, and only two for to believe, prizzy and crazy, and not crazy, which is perhaps the best <laughs> of all the four forms. Well, as I say, the labeling for middle and late is unjustified, since all four forms are found in both middle and late texts. And some of us will know that uh, Neil Kennedy has uh, argued that these labels are divisive and unnecessary. And so we may have to uh, modify the, I hope one will, modify the online dictionary in, in the light of that evidence. So let's conclude. No very deep conclusions here, but interest, interesting nevertheless. Four forms of these verbal nouns were found in both middle and in late Cornish. And I've shown the development of each from British. Each form is found with a, associated with a particular set of texts. But of all the four, if you really wanted to go for one, Pezzi and Crazy has the simplest paradigm and the one that would fit Middle Cornish best. Marastal Yard. Right. Uh, yeah. Here is the here is the talk. Uh, place eighth or uh, where did s go? Now, in Middle Cornish, we have the word bisquest, meaning ever or never. Now, probably you may have noticed this becoming this bisquest becoming biscas in later Cornish, and like me, maybe you wondered what's happening there. Is this going to be a joke? I mean, sounds in some cases like assimilation, but in later Cornish. Well, let's look at about uh, five cases. But first, yep, look away now. If, unlike me, you actually enjoy suspense, are you looking away if you want to? Good, keep looking away. And okay, you can look again now. Right. Here we have at the top, firstly, just about the oldest traditional Cornish text and beneath it, the, the latest. In Passion Agan Arleth, that, and that's my attempt at paleography, thanks to the new Evertype book on the subject, we can see in Bithqueth. Uh, there Peter, are about 50. Peter, yep. so, um, he okay. has said that you're dropping out a bit. Do you want to switch your video off? Aha. Uh -huh. If you switch your video off just to reduce the bandwidth you're actually using, that might improve the sound. Great. Thank you for that, Gareth. Lovely. I pressed the stop video button. Um, um, I pressed the stop video button and it's um, thinking about it, which is right. something, I guess. Uh, <laughs> I've got a little slidey thing here. Um, the, uh, okay, um, can you see my video still or um, can you? I we can we see a still photograph of you? Okay, hopefully, and we, can, we can still see your you can still see the text, right? Lovely, and is is the audio a little, little bit better with my voice sounding? I think uh, so, smashing. Okay, and some thank you, Gareth, much appreciated. And as we were saying there, um, we can see about, uh, there, there are rather about uh, 50 uh, attestations of the word bithqueth uh, all through the middle Cornish corpus and they all look pretty much like bithqueth as you can see there. At the bottom of the screen you can see down in William Bediner's letter of about 400 years later that first th is changed to a s in biscath and there are about five of these in the later Cornish corpus, all of those with biscath with s instead of that first uh, th sound. Also, by the way, later on, the earlier qu 
is always by then a k. So is that a sign of a civilization of th in later Cornish? Well, there are lots of possible other explanations for this. For example, it could have been a Breton cognate borrowed at Biscath, or, or maybe dissimulation of the first of the two toots and delabilization of qu to just k, or maybe it just might have been easier to say that way. In sum, whatever happened, the change from Bithquath to Biscath can already be described by currently understood laws in Cornish language, so there's no proof here of such general assimilation of the th sound. No proof. By the way, there are several purported images of Jose Dolly Pentraith. I just wish we knew what William Badinner looked like, and that, that's he who wrote and who outlived her. Let's look at a second case. The context here is John Tonkin's rhyme of 1695, about William of Orange's side fighting with that of James Stuart in 1688-1689 and defeating them. In the top text, we have the word Theseus for defeat. Now, in the middle Cornish corpus, there are about a dozen instances of feather, the verb for to conquer or to beat, as we can see here. There's an example below with the th. I wondered, did th of feather become s of Theseus? Actually, the consensus is no. That word is actually from Theseus which is a borrowed English word and the same word as in English today we might use to be phased or deterred or driven off from something. So no, there's no later Cornish assimilation proof there either. You can see the question mark at top right as even the link between these words is doubtful. Still, onward and seaward. A zook, A-Z-O-O-K, what on earth does that mean? Well, when I first come across the word, it was a word that was in an article by Richard Gillis. And uh, Richard Gillis was one of the blokes that, uh, along with Mr. Northey and Mr. Pryor, I think, from Newquay Rowing Club, rescued gigs from the Sillies in the 50s. Um, Richard gave us this word, azook, as uh, the word used by the, the coxswains of the Newquay gigs when they wanted a bit more power and speed. In the latter part of Resurrectio Domini, they're trying to get rid of Pontius Pilate's body. Eventually, they put his body on a boat, which they then heave out across the sea. That's the command you can see red-lined in the top text. Herduch, push you lot, specifically the boat. There's an attested dialect word of uncertain orthography, spelt here azuk, to encourage oarsmen aboard a craft to row harder. Could Herduch and azuk be one and the same? Has perhaps assimilation changed to z? Consensus is that this is extremely unlikely, as in later Cornish, r, r is almost always changed to just r, leaving no th to assimilate. Also, the ending ch is usually lost, so from educh, according to the rules, we might expect something like eru or similar. So there's no proof here either. Well, let's get our boots on and head inland for the fourth case. Unlike in Breton and in Welsh, the word for milker or dairy person is not found written in Cornish texts. You can see the lathe part in the cognates there. What's that got to do with the surname Lecher or Lather, if such a word existed in Cornish? You can see here the surname and place name Lati and the surname Letcher mapped here, thanks to work by Bernard Deacon in his book and website. The surnames Letcher and Leite mostly neighbouring one another in the 1861 census. Now, the place name and surname Leite has the lexeme Leith for milk and a T sound from T, house, Leith T, milk house or dairy. So, how could the Th of Leither be assimilated? Well, see how St. Agnes in 1861 had the greatest number of Letcher surnames. Now look at the map from Ken George's 2015 paper showing how around Pidar and slightly east and west, the area around the western north coast in pink on the map, surrounding St. Agnes, there was a zone 
where the sound d or t was consistently not so much assimilated to s, but instead in place names became palatalized to ch. Could the t of leiti have been kept in lather and in this area then been palatalized to ch or affricated ch in lather? Or could the th of lather have been assimilated but that assimilation took the palatalized ch sound of this region's dialect? Actually, in surname records, earlier lecher is earliest found outside of the Pidar area and thus outside of the strongest area of this ch palatalization effect. So it probably was not a factor. So no proof of assimilation of th here. But don't give up. Don't. This last case is more certain. We know that the second person singular present, that's you, just one person, generally ended with th in middle Cornish for many verbs, including gil, to do or to make. However, we find some of these endings, for example, with gil, to do or to make, have an ending instead with s in later Cornish. Aha, sibilation? Not really. For one thing, these are at the end of the word, not between vowels, as had been in the other cases. We also know of several other verbs, where second person singular present likewise has s spelt endings later on. Furthermore, in the shown examples here, both are from the same 17th century script for creation of the world, just a few hundred lines apart, so the change seemed to have been uncertain. Even in this hugely important verb gil, there were some changes involving s in other contexts. For example, in personal or third person past ending, usually formally written with a g, instead being in later Cornish written with an s or a z, of which second person th to s might have been some sort of imitation. So no proof either in this final case of a generalized later Cornish assimilation of th. Now, as we can see here, uh, the conclusions, which are entirely negative, pretty much speak for themselves, really. Now, in addition to several gratefully received personal communications of a device, I used the sources you can see here, and there will be a web link URL to this presentation shown in the next slide. Thanks for listening. The end. And uh, since my hypothesis really didn't do very well there, um, you know, I'm not going to dwell on the thing probably, but um, if anybody has anything to uh, add or to share, uh, please do so. Thank you. My um, PhD thesis is looking at the history of the language. Um, however, because my undergraduate degree was in languages um, and I was a languages teacher for many years, um, we've, I've also been researching um, language death and language revival. Um, so as part of that, I've been researching why languages become extinct. Um, how we define a language as actually being extinct, which I think is going to be very interesting in terms of Cornish, and what has been done by both linguists and communities to both preserve and revive their particular languages. As a comparison for my own studies, I've been concentrating on the decline of Irish and its revival in Northern Ireland. The focus of this is further understanding the reasons why the use of Cornish declined and how the decline in the use of Irish, which is well documented, may give us a model to understand the less well documented decline of Cornish. In a similar fashion, the revival of Irish in Northern Ireland is a few steps ahead of the current situation here in Cornwall, in terms of both its use and acceptance of the language by a wider section of the community and its official status. And so I'd also like to share points of interest and use which should be considered by those working to further language revival here in Cornwall. 
There are several stages to the death of a language. The first stage is usually political or social discrimination against speakers of a particular language, either through official policies or benign neglect. In both Cornwall and Ireland, during the period in which the use of the vernacular languages declined, the English government was in power and therefore English was both the language of government, along with Latin, and increasingly the language of business. Although the Bible was produced in Irish in the 17th century, unlike in Cornish, English became the language of the church and printing other books in Irish was restricted from the 17th century. William Scarron in 1680, The Causes of Cornish Speech's Decay, gave 16 reasons for the decline of the language. Amongst these were the use of Latin in both writing and speech, the influence from Devon of spoken English, trade, especially in fishing and tin, being carried out in other languages because foreigners were unable to learn Cornish, and the necessity for young people to learn the Lord's Prayer, Creed and Ten Commandments in English. Similarly, Robert McAdam, editor of the Ulster Journal of Archaeology, writing in the 19th century, gave three reasons for the decay of Irish. Scholars who had no interest in the living language, writers using obscure language, and the attitude of the Catholic Church in neglecting to teach the catechism and to give sermons in the language. English had spread to most towns in Ireland, but in 1800, at the time of the Act of Union, half the population was Irish speaking. We cannot ignore the effects of the potato famine and emigration on the Irish speaking population. Most emigrants moved to major English speaking cities such as Liverpool and Boston. Being able to speak English offered some hope of escaping destitution. English was the prestige language, whereas Irish literary, literally embodied poverty and a difficult life. Similarly, between 1815 and 1915, 250,000 people emigrated from Cornwall, caused in part by the depletion of copper and tin reserves and the opening up of new mining areas, which gathered a, generated a demand for the skills of Cornish miners elsewhere. And the 1840s also witnessed, to a lesser extent, the same potato blight in Cornwall that affected the crops in Ireland and elsewhere in Europe. Another of the principal agents which contributed to the decline of the Irish language in the island of Ireland as a whole was educational policy during the 19th century. No provision was made for the Irish speaking population in 1831 when the regulations of the Commissioners of National Education were drawn up. This inevitably had an effect on those monolingual Irish speaking areas where children were forced to learn to read in a language they did not speak. Irish speakers numbered just over 300,000 people in 1851, around 23% of the population, and the bilingual population, one and a half million people. The Intermediate Act of 1878 finally included Irish within the national school curriculum as a result of a campaign by the Society for the Protection of the Irish Language, but only as a peripheral subject worth less than other languages, as you can see on the slide. Added to this is that very few teachers were qualified to teach Irish. The language was taught outside regular school hours and only to a limited age group. At the end of the 19th century, the number of schools teaching Irish was approximately 1% of the total, and the number of pupils examined in Irish never exceeded 2,000 from a total enrolment of 800,000. Finally, in 18 Irish was included as an optional subject at teacher training colleges. Every student had to offer one optional subject and those who took Irish were awarded an extra certificate on passing their training. However, as a result of the previous language policy, numbers of students able to speak Irish and therefore wanting to teach it were low and only 57 of 700 trainee teachers in the last three years of the 19th century took Irish as their optional subject. Uh, just to compare with Cornwall at the time, prior to the 19th century, there was little formal education in England. There was a system of grammar schools and some schools run by religious establishments and dame schools. But of those schools established before 1700, the closest to, school, to Cornwall were in Exeter. And it wasn't until 1811 that national schools were established, thus well into the period of decline of the Cornish language. 
a statistical essay presented to the Royal Cornwall Polytechnic Society in 1839 by the Reverend Courtney gives us details of the schools available in Penzance at the time. There were two endowed boys schools and two endowed girls schools, that is national schools supported by subscriptions, 11 private boys and 14 private girls schools. Between them, these 29 schools educated around 1100 pupils. At this time, however, many Cornish children would have, by necessity, been contributing to the family income by working. Boys, obviously, in the Greater Cornwall area, working in mines and actually down the mines from the age of 12. Once a language is no longer being learned by children, it is defined as moribund. And as the old speakers become less numerous and more elderly, it begins to die out. This was the case in large areas of Ireland in the 19th century. In Cornwall, in the 17th century, Nicholas Boson, later regarded as one of the early group of antiquarians who tried to preserve Cornish, was actually prevented from learning Cornish from neighbours and family servants when he was a boy by his mother. He subsequently learned the language as an adult in order to carry out business with fishermen. Boson's experience shows us that for many Cornish people of a certain class, even during a period without the availability of mass education, English was perceived as necessary in order to get ahead. After the Government of Ireland Act of 1920, Northern Ireland was created through partition in 1921 with the majority Protestant and Unionist population. The state was set up specifically as a Protestant state for a Protestant people, and therefore the Irish language was long perceived as connected with an enemy force. Government debates released to public inspection in the 1990s make it clear that the Irish language was not directly suppressed in Northern Ireland, so as to avoid creating a rallying point of public protest from the marginalised nationalists. The language was permitted to be taught outside the normal school curricula in certain areas. In discussing the Irish language in Northern Ireland, the political element cannot be ignored. Language policy has been used as a political football by politicians of both sides, and the Irish language played a significant role during the hunger strike protests by IRA prisoners in the 1980s. However, it is the grassroots, community-led language work which is of most relevance and concern to, Cornish, to language revival in Cornwall. Perhaps, unfortunately, revitalisation of the Irish language in Northern Ireland is centred on Belfast, which was home to the only urban Irish language community on the entire island of Ireland, but is now being joined by Derry Londonderry. The event which seems to have initiated the Irish language revival in Belfast, or at the very least had the most lasting effect, occurred in the late 1960s when a group of young families decided to build houses together in the Shores Road area of West Belfast, establish their own Irish-speaking community and bring up their children speaking Irish. In 1971, they opened a primary school which used Irish as the language of education. The original core of the school comprised the Shores Road children, but by 1986, there were 350 pupils enrolled including many from neighbouring areas, five nursery schools, over 60 evening classes and several intensive courses have been run for the unemployed. For these children, Irish was the language they spoke at home, at school and at church. By 1984, a weekly Irish language newspaper had been established in Belfast and the area was home to the only Irish language bookshop outside Dublin. An all-Irish social club had been established, mass was said weekly for Irish speakers, and over 300 streets had bilingual signs. An annual festival to promote Irish in schools had been established. These achievements did not occur without a struggle. It took a two-year campaign of protest, lobbying and publicity before the BBC began broadcasting Irish language programmes on Radio Ulster. The Shores Road Primary School finally began to receive state funding in 1984 after years of being financed by community efforts. However, by the 1976-77 academic year, Irish was being taught as an additional language in 142 primary schools, 13% of the total, and 71 or 38% of all secondary schools. 
it was also possible by 1978 to study Irish language and literature as part of the Irish Studies Programme at the University of Ulster. The number of speakers of minority language needs to be examined in terms of proportion of the overall population of the country and majority language speaking population in which it sits. These statistics are far more easily available for the use of Irish during the period of its decline and revival as an Irish language question was included on the census from 1851. Although after partition, a question on language use was not included in the Northern Ireland census until 1991, leaving a gap of 80 years in our knowledge. By 1991, the census data showed over 27,000 people in Belfast and over 9,000 people in Derry could speak Irish. The age distribution was positively skewed with 48% aged under 24 and only 7% aged over 65. As a comparison, in the same census, 22% of Welsh speakers were aged over 65. There has been a so far unsuccessful push to have a question regarding Cornish speaking included on census forms although 557 people declared it as their main language in the 2011 census. Evidence from the early 1990s shows that there was interest in the language amongst those from the Protestant community, including an all-female group of adult learners in the working class Shank Hill area of Belfast, but also amongst higher level socio-economic classes. This was put down to the increasing presence of Irish in the media and the education system and enhanced levels of Irish national identity across both communities. Irish language broadcasting increased on English medium radio and television and Irish medium television broadcast by the Republic of Ireland was available in parts of Northern Ireland. By 1997, all Irish medium secondary schools had been established in Belfast and Derry and in the 2001 census, over 10% of the entire population of Northern Ireland claimed some knowledge of the language. By 2017, the Irish speaking population of Northern Ireland was recorded at 11%. So it will be interesting to see if next year's census shows any real growth and in which areas of the population. More recently, last month saw the launch of a series of short animated films created by the Protestant Unionist community as part of the Cheeras project, which provides adult education in Irish. These films, produced in conjunction with Don Duncan, a lecturer in broadcast journalism at Queen's University, aim to show normal, everyday Protestants and Unionists engaging with the language, explaining why they decided to learn the language and what they get from it. The first film features Gail McCune, who began learning Irish in an evening class seven years ago, and is now beginning the second year of an Irish language degree. Funding from, from the Turis project allows high level language learners such as McCune to attend university. What then of the situation and status of the Cornish language in Cornwall? The modern revival dates from the publication of Henry Jenner's Handbook of the Cornish Language in 1904, initially with a group of enthusiasts who began learning the language and resulting in the formation of the Cornish Gorset in 1928 and many old Cornwall societies. As the century progressed, magazines entirely written in Cornish, such as Kerno in the 1930s and Anne Leth Canuick from the 1950s were produced. These magazines with both articles and stories, as well as excerpts from medieval literature, gave people something to read and an incentive for learning. Classes were established in both Cornwall and London and key figures of the revival, such as Robert Morton Lance and A.S.T. Smith, began producing teaching materials. In 1967, the Cornish Language Board was established. This undertook the examination of Cornwall, of Cornish, sorry, initially at three levels, with the highest examining candidates at a level just above the old O level. By the 1980s, there were around 20 adult education classes in Cornwall. The correspondence course Canuit Dre Lither had been set up, and exam results showed increasing numbers of proficient speakers. In 1989, this scheme was extended to a fourth grade, and by 2000, the number of classes had risen to 36. In 2019, a total of 82 candidates from evening classes and the correspondence course took these examinations across the four grades. 
Certain families involved in the language movement brought up their children speaking Cornish at home. However, there has not been the momentum within the educational establishment to support these initiatives. In 1979, the organisation Dalith was founded to support such efforts and six families known at the time who were bringing up their children as bilingual. And in 1980, a children's magazine, Len Halu, was produced. Eventually, the Movian Scholio Methrim nursery school movement established the Skol de Sadon Canuic at Cornwall College in Poole in 2010, providing a Saturday morning session for both school children aged two to five and child-based Cornish lessons for parents. In 2017, the Skol Vethrin Carenza became an Ofsted registered fully Cornish medium daycare centre for children up to eight, and a new setting was due to open at Easter this year. Before the 1980s, Cornish was reported to be taught in a handful of schools. The 1984 State of the Language report found it was being taught in seven primary and two secondary schools. With the introduction of the national curriculum, any Cornish language provision was confined to lunchtime and after school clubs and reliant on either volunteer provision or a keen teacher who was able to either speak Cornish or use those resources available. The Cornish Language Partnership, MAGA, sent three language learning packs to all primary schools across Cornwall and in 2012 their two part-time education officers worked with around 20 schools across Cornwall. MAGA also delivered training on Cornish to teachers, providing teaching materials and some taste sessions, usually in the form of workshops. Since 2016, Golden Tree has been contracted to develop and support the teaching, learning and use of Cornish. Their task was to embed Cornish as a modern language across a core group of primary schools, rising from five to 50 within a five year period. In 2018, this programme was run at 15 schools in Penzance and Liscard. However, for Cornish to succeed at primary level, it does need both the support of head teachers and a teacher who is either able to speak Cornish or able to run sessions. As yet, Cornish does not have enough of a stronghold within the primary system in Cornwall, either within curriculum time or as part of a club, but this is due to inadequate, pro inadequate provision in terms of manpower. And as school staff become more willing and able to deliver the language and less reliant on outside providers, this should continue to grow. A key marker as to the success of Cornish in primary schools will be the acceptance of Cornish as a foreign language in terms of adherence to the national curriculum as teaching maybe of any modern or ancient foreign language. It was possible to learn Cornish to GCSE until 1996 when a total of 42 candidates took the examination. However, the examination was no longer commercially viable and it was scrapped. In 2000, Cornish was being taught at four secondary schools as part of a club. But as with the primary curriculum, finding for the space for Cornish within the secondary curriculum is all but impossible. The teaching of a modern foreign language is compulsory to the age of 14, with the proviso that this provide the basis for further study. How, therefore, do we define Cornish within these parameters? The provision of Cornish at secondary level would also require a vast increase in levels of resources and teacher training, both of which are currently heavily reliant on the voluntary sector within Cornish adult education. For Cornish to succeed within the state education system, it still requires status, a place within school day, properly resourced and paid peripatetic teachers, or resources and retraining for existing teachers within schools. Apart from adult education, the areas in which Cornish is showing a growth in use are cultural. One of the means by which the Cornish language has been widely disseminated has been through song, with singers such as Brenda Whitton and more recently Gweno speak, speak singing in Cornish. There is a flourishing folk music scene which uses the language and many choirs also sing both secular and sacred songs translated into Cornish. Public worship has taken place in Cornish annually since 1933 and the first wedding to take place in Cornish occurred in 1964. In the 1970s an advisory board was established by the Bishop of Truro and services now take place regularly in Cornish in both Truro Cathedral and many other churches. A project to translate the Bible into Cornish 
finally finished in, 19, in 2018 and is now available as an app. Cornish is supported by cultural, religious and political organisations based within the county and there are strong links to organisations within the other Celtic nations. Cornwall plays a full and active role in the Pan-Celtic Song Competition and the annual Celtic Festival held in Lorien. A small number of specialist Cornish language bookshops have been established. Anganus, a monthly magazine, has been in continuous print since 1976. Increasing numbers of novels are not only translated into Cornish, but written in Cornish too, and Cornish is becoming more of a presence in other media. In 1989, Rod Lyon began broadcasting a programme called Craw de Crawn on BBC Radio Cornwall, and in 2000, he began a weekly news bulletin in Cornish, which continues to this day. No Other One Satan started in 2007, and in 2008 became Radio Angenu Egba, a weekly programme of music and conversation entirely in Cornish, in Cornish and broadcast online. This was joined by Paul Wallach and Angenu Egba in 2016, and a monthly programme, and Nice, began in 2017. This has been, in part, maintained through crowdfunding. One area of visible growth in the use of Cornish has been businesses using Cornish in their signage, and some branch names, including large chains such as Asda, Tesco and Weatherspoons, as well as many local businesses. In 2016, the ice cream company Kelly's launched the first national television advert in Cornish. Where Cornwall does struggle is in funding for the language. A small amount of money was available during the 1990s from European cultural funding sources, but these often required collaborations across member states and the Cornish language did not have enough critical mass at that time to truly benefit from these schemes. In 2000, Corn council funding for Cornish was 5,000 pounds. Between 2010 and 2015, the coalition government gave around £120,000 per year for the development and promotion of Cornish. Since then, Cornwall Council has spent £150,000 each year on the language, and in November 2016, it was confirmed that Cornish was now the responsibility of Cornwall Council and the Cornish Historic Environment Fund Forum. This was, however, to change once more when £150,000 of government funding was granted for Cornish in the 2019-20 fiscal year. One of the ways in which languages can be preserved is through creating new uses for the language or continuing to be creative in the language as we are seeing in Northern Ireland with the recent videos. By involving people in the development of a new corpus of literature it gives them ownership of and a sense of value in their particular linguistic culture. The technology available to us in the 21st century means that the production of books, newspapers and websites is both low cost and democratic. However, one of the biggest problems facing those seeking to revive a language is a lack of appropriate teaching materials and qualified teachers, as we saw was the case in Ireland at the end of the 19th century. This necessitates the provision of a wide variety of language materials, the coinage of new vocabulary and training programmes for teachers. A lack of education in any language makes maintaining its use difficult, both on a personal and collective level, and the push for Irish medium education in Northern Ireland is one of the principal factors in the growth of the language there. Learning a language solely through the medium of grammar books and dictionaries only gives an artificial flavour of the range of use of a particular language. Therefore, we should seek to provide as diverse a range of education and educational materials as possible to preserve the language as a living being, fit for purpose in our everyday lives, and to better reflect the purposes for which it was originally used. What, therefore, does this mean for language revival movements such as that in Cornwall? It can be a daunting task. Given any lack of appropriate resources, setting realistic priorities has to be of the highest importance. Inevitably, this necessitates the involvement of small, voluntary groups working at a very local level rather than any form of national agency or network. By concentrating, in the first instance, on community-led and financed voluntary efforts, a, min a minority can control the language and its use far more easily and, with the aim of achieving small, incremental goals, realise far more than the imposition of a top-down policy requiring success in larger, more unrealistic measures of, of success. 
That does not mean state aid, especially financial, should be avoided, but it normally comes with a price, namely undermining a minority population's responsibility for and right to control the language. Requests for bilingual education, for example, upset the status quo, and schemes such as these often attract criticism if financed by majority taxes. The most important marker of success in judging language revival when it is being carried out from a bottom-up position is to look back at and take account of the starting position of the language when revival began. Language diversity and preservation should not hark back to an idealised past, but always be aiming forward, promoting a sustainable, appropriate and empowering development of the language. Languages have always coexisted and multilingualism can add to strong local identities. Well, first of all, Ditta from uh, Bavaria, uh, from a slightly gloomy Würzburg. Uh, thank you so much for having me. And I would like to say congratulations on, Anal uh, on, on organizing this whole thing um, so, so effectively. And it's been a real pleasure to be here and listen to everyone's talks. I've really learned so much, especially because I come from a slightly unique position, not being a Cornish speaker myself. and being also unrelated directly to Cornwall or Cornish, except academically, as you will see uh, today. Um, so I am pursuing a master's degree in general in applied linguistics in Würzburg, and I'm also a, um, a scholarship holder of the German Academic Exchange Service. And what I would like to present to you today is um, a little study of mine conducted um, in the, in the topic, on the topic of attitudes towards Cornish, well, an att attitudinal study. Uh, I think I'm going to spare you the uh, introductory remarks on uh, what Cornish is and because I, that, that's not the appropriate audience for that. But what I do like to uh, uh, point out is um, a word or two about attitudes maybe and the previous attitudinal uh, research done in Cornwall because it's not, it, it, it is really nothing new. And then I would like to present, if you would allow me my own little study um, with its results, and then we can discuss its uh, limitations, but also hopefully uh, some little potential that it has um, for studying attitudes towards Cornish further on. So um, what are language attitudes? They're really psychological constructs that are um, hard to pin down but what they basically boil down to is how people think, feel, and act towards a certain phenomenon. In this case, uh, they're, uh, how they think, feel, and act towards Cornish. And what I'm especially interested here is the status of modern Cornish, so uh, Cornish post, or should I say during the revival. Um, so I'm not interested in the big political picture as much as the opinions of those 600 speakers that it has according to the um, 2011 census and ethnologue and omniglot. What I would really like to explore is the link between language and identity and the, the nation building power of language. Um, I was really interested um, in discovering the whole world of language attitudes and how social linguists can um, use scientific methods to um, deduce what people think and how they feel and how they act in relation to um, a certain language, in this case, in relation to their own language. And I do think that this kind of research is very valuable um, for understanding the role of language in society and the role of particular languages then. Um, so some authors say that the very, revival, the very revival of Cornish is an expression of the Cornish identity on the one hand, but on the other hand, um, Cornish has been, or, or the Cornish identity has been frequently uh, said to be hybrid pluralist of England and not of England and really ambivalent. And I think language uh, can often prove to be the key, or rather, well, the attitude towards, uh, towards that language can prove to be the key to understanding uh, its precise role in society, which is why I uh, decided to conduct this study um, within the scope of a, a course at university, which is called Language Attitudes. But then I chose Cornish because I really found it fascinating. Um, I found the, the whole history really, really fascinating and what people do all the dedication and work that goes into um, reviving the language and keeping it alive. And um, the, well, that, that was the inspiration. But then in the course of the study, uh, I realized 
how how much deeper it is really um, than than what I thought to be in the in the first place. Uh, so as I said, attitudinal research is nothing new to Cornwall. There they ha there have been several studies done, and um, some studies are still being done. Um, an example is the are two studies from 2007. One is the quality of life tracker survey, which also included uh, some questions that could be could, that could fall under the scope of language attitudes. Um, some questions um, were about the, the people's awareness of the Cornish language, which is, which is I know, a very general um, term, but it could still be uh, related to language attitudes. And there was also a question about the support of its use in public, which also falls under the scope. And then in the same year, um, there was a study conducted by uh, the Cornish Language Partnership, which really asked people after the um, activities that they do related to the Cornish language and how they actively use it in their lives. But what I would really like to focus on and what really inspired my own study was a 2013 um, study done by, uh, by the Cornwall Council and the Cornish Language Partnership. And I find this one to be particularly valuable because it is an attitudinal study in the real sense of the word. Uh, in that it uh, used the direct method of a questionnaire to elicit um, questions that directly um, that can directly be connected to uh, behavior and cognition and uh, emotion, which are three components that I mentioned earlier, earlier, so how people act, feel, and think towards their language. And it looks something like this. Well, these are uh, this is a part of the uh, this is a part of the results. Uh, what they did was they, they asked 151, uh, well, they, they asked everyone, actually, they, they distributed the survey through uh, the internal emails of the Cornwall Council, but um, they did get uh, 151 uh, respondents. Uh, as you can see, not all of them answered every question. Um, that's because they had the option not to answer, so to, to skip a question. Uh, and what they did was they calculated the results in percentages to get statements such as, for example, 53.3% uh, of the respondents strongly agree that the Cornish language helps to make Cornwall a distinctive place. So basically what the respondents have, had to do were, uh, was to rate uh, statements um, using Likert scales uh, to see, also the questions are posed um, uh, the questions were in the form of statements, which they, they had to rate and to see whether they agreed with them or not. Um, so yes, as I mentioned, uh, they discovered, for example, that 83% of the informants agree or strongly agree. So they tended to group the two positive uh, responses together that they would not like the Cornish language to disappear completely. Um, and th this, this study has, um, this, this study is particularly valuable for, for two reasons. Well, first of all, it informs uh, practical work in, in Cornwall regarding the preservation of the language. But second of all, on a more academic level, it informs uh, further academic research by uh, giving an outlook and of course, and some tips for reformulating the questions, um, which I then did in my own study. Uh, I listened to what they had to say. Uh, there are some downsides as well. Um, for example, as you could see in the uh, previous slide, uh, not all respondents answered all of the questions. Um, and also, while well, giving the results in percentages might be useful, but they did not perform uh, many statistical tests. And for example, the relation between uh, age and um, attitudes towards Cornish was not, was not really explored. Um, so what I wanted to do for my study was a partial replication of this formal council study. And I deliberately used some of the same phrasing to allow for a partial comparability with this study. And what I expected to find was that the general positive attitude towards Cornish would be confirmed. But I also wanted to try and see, um, to explore the variables which could um, be correlated. So for example, uh, fluency and attitude, uh, it would be expected that people who are more fluent would have a more positive attitude towards the language. And then I, uh, what I was uh, particularly inter interested in was the uh, variable of age. I wanted to see um, how attitudes vary um, through age and if there's um, any possible interesting uh, things to be found there. Um, so what I did was I also used the direct method, which was a questionnaire. Um, I distributed it online in um, two Facebook groups and then uh, two Cornish language organizations kindly agreed to share it with their members. Uh, which meant that I uh, really got many responses. 
um, before distributing it, I had two independent beta readers because I wanted to see whether the questions were phrased properly. And this led to some changes from the phrasing um, in, the, in the original study. So for example, in the 2013 Cornwall language, um, uh, Cornwall Council, sorry, a study, they said a learning Cornish improves educational skills, which was found by my beta readers to be too vague because what are really educational skills? So I decided to change to replace that with learning Cornish would be helpful for a person's general education, so as to somehow indicate what I want my participants to think about when they're answering the questions. Uh, so again, as in the previous study, um, I had statements that the participants had to rate using Likert scales from one to four. And I will talk about in the uh, limitations part about how this may not have been uh, the ideal choice, but more on that later. And I also had, um, I also tried to organize the questions into three uh, thematical groups, according to what the questions were about, of course. So the first group um, of questions were general statements about Cornish, then, then came questions about the visibility of the language, and then questions about efforts done to preserve the language. So they were all statements related to these categories that the participants had to rate, according to whether they agree or do not agree. So the scale ran from one to four when one was strongly disagree, two was uh, disagree, two was agree, and four was strongly agree. Uh, so in total, I had 19 I uh, items that I organized in these seven questions. Uh, in between these um, three times five statements, I had um, questions about age, uh, self-reported fluency. So the participants had to state their own fluency in Cornish. And then there was, an, um, there was a question about where they use the Cornish language, which, which I also wanted to find out. And in the end, and this proved to be particularly valuable, I had um, an open question for the additional thoughts and observations of the participants. And what I did differently from the uh, council study was that I made all questions compulsory. So the participants had no option to skip a question or not to answer a question. And there was also no option that they could click um, other than uh, stating that they agree or disagree with a statement, which I know can be a little frustrating, but on the other hand, they really had to rate a statement uh, on the other, uh, on the one on the other uh, side of the spectrum. So there was really no, uh, no place for skipping. And um, all these, these uh, questions about age and self-reported fluency um, made for useful breaks between thematic groups so that the person would not get uh, like 15 statements to rate all at once. I tried to structure it so that it would prove as uh, easy as possible so that it would not become tiresome or frustrating. And um, another interesting thing was that I put the question about age at the very end because it tends to be a very personal question. And it is advised that one puts it in the end so that people would say, okay, I answered everything now, I might as well answer um, that as well. Um, here in this slide, you can see a sample. Uh, so these are the statements on the left hand side. And then um, because the, the uh, survey was conducted online naturally had buttons they, they could click whether they strongly disagree, uh, strongly disagree, disagree, agree or strongly agree with a particular statement. And I deliberately used some of the same phrasing, uh, as I said, uh, and I also tried to um, include some statements that would trigger a strong emotional response in the participants because I really wanted them to think about the role that the Cornish plays in their lives. Uh, you can see, for example, this statement, the Cornish language was revived artificially and unnecessarily, which I, um, it, it's, a, it's a bit cruel to, to involve something like this, but I really wanted to provoke a strong emotional response to make people think about um, their answers. Uh, so now I come to the results. Uh, I received 73 complete questionnaires between the 12th and 31st December of uh, 2019. Uh, which means that the analysis that I did, the quantitative bit, was done for this particular set of data, even though since then I got uh, another uh, five questionnaires, I think, or maybe it's less than that, that I still haven't, uh, haven't included because they, they uh, only arrived recently. Um, and I excluded five incomplete questionnaires from the analysis because I really wanted to have um, participants that uh, followed through the, entire, the entirety of the questionnaire. And now we divide my results into two parts. Uh, part A is uh, this partial comparison with the 2013 study. And part B presents some uh, new findings and put hopefully potentially some new avenues to explore. So for part A, you can see in this chart that I um, 
selected all of the statements that were worded uh, exactly the same in both studies. So um, in the middle, you can see the um, Cornish language partnership study from 2013. And in the end, you can see the results of my study. So I also tried to adapt the, uh, the results to the way that they presented them to ensure for maximum comparability, even though it is still limited. Um, most of all, because uh, their study had 151 respondents and mine only had 73. So we will have to account for that, of course, which makes for a very limited kind of comparison. But even so, what I'd like to note is that uh, some answers which were uh, which people were previously rather neutral about, for example, only about half of the participants said that the Cornish language helped to make Cornwall a distinctive place in 2013, whereas in 2019, so in my study, 83.6% of them strongly agreed. So I, when you only take the, the strongest sentiment, and there seems to be some kind of uh, increase in awareness regarding the businesses in the in Cornish language. So maybe maybe some new potentials are being unlocked there. Um, even though I would be really careful about drawing any any strong conclusions from this, uh, mostly because of the limitations, as I said. But still, maybe there are some trends. Most of the numbers tend to be really high um, in the in the newer study. And then oh, the two variables that I was most interested in, as I said, were age and fluency. So I will start with fluency. Um, as I said, participants were asked to uh, self-report, so, so to, to say how fluent they think they are in Cornish. And the categories there were, um, they know a few phrases in Cornish. They can hold a basic conversation in Cornish. They are semi-fluent or they are fluent. And then what I did was uh, I plotted the, uh, the chart for um, five of the most salient statements with the strongest uh, and the most extreme positive ratings by fluency. So for example, you can see um, the green line is the statement, I would not like the Cornish language to disappear completely. And it is 100% strongly, strongly agree um, for uh, people who are really fluent in Cornish, whereas it dips a little for people who know a few phrases. Um, then what is also interesting is the yellow line. The Cornish language gives me a sense of belonging to Cornwall, which is rather low for uh, people who only know a, flu uh, who only know a few phrases in Cornish. But then it also takes a dip for people who are uh, only semi-fluent in the language. Um, again, the results are not such that they could provide some great um, statistical um, well, importance because I couldn't really perform all those statistical analysis and I will tell you why in a minute. But still, it's nice to see that there are some questions open up that could potentially be explored further. And the similar goes for age. I took, I will share with you now two of the most salient questions. Uh, so what I did now was I took a little different approach and I took the, uh, I, I analyzed the, the results statement by statement. So for example, here you can see the analysis for the statement, the Cornish language helps to make Cornwall a distinctive place. And the age groups uh, are the same as in the uh, Cornish language partnership study. So I tried to make it, to, I tried to base my uh, methodology as much as I could on that. Uh, so the age groups are 19 to 35 and then 35 to 50, 51 to 65 and 66 or older. I also had a group that was, um, well, 18 and lower than 18, but I only got one respondent. So I really tried to exclude, I, I, I excluded that from the analysis. And as you can see, um, there is a slight dip in, um, in the group from 35 to 50. But for this statement, the Cornish language helps to make Cornwall a distinctive place. So not as many people in this age group agree as in other um, age groups. But as I said, it is not statistically significant. It's just maybe a suggestion for further research. And then again, the same goes for uh, the other statement which is I feel proud when I hear someone speak Cornish. Um, again, everything is the same, just the, the statement is different. And you can see the slight dip again in this age group. Uh, again, not statistically significant, mostly because I only had such a narrow scale from one to four. And I mean, it, it sounds nice when you create the question and you think, OK, people will have to decide. They will have to be brisk and say, uh, I strongly agree or I uh, or I strongly disagree, but then in the statistical analysis, it doesn't really prove very useful. But I mean, we're, we all, we're all still learning, so that's okay, I guess. Um, I would like to now take some time to discuss the qualitative results, which were, um, for me personally, very um, 
informative and even, even better than the quantitative results. So the participants all stress the importance of social gatherings and social media um, in the sense of getting together with other people, uh, talking in Cornish and preserving the language. And what I particularly loved was how 49 out of 73 participants reported that they frequently use Cornish at home with family and friends, and only four of my participants report never, never using Cornish. Uh, and then eight participants mentioned the value of heritage and tradition, and then of passing on the language to their children or grandchildren. Um, and then what is also interesting that an additional 20 stress its vitality and role in the modern reality of Cornwall is just a part of who, their surroundings and who they are. And there was also a smaller number of participants that mentioned the importance for education, for religion, and for its ties to other Celtic languages, especially Welsh, um, because they see it as a way to be connected uh, to those um, fellow Celtic languages. Uh, and well done, the limitations, which are many. Uh, first of all, the number of respond respondents, because I really, well, it's not fair to say that I expected more because I really got many more um, responses than, than, I, uh, in, than I initially uh, thought that I would have. But I mean, still for a uh, real statistical analysis, it, it helps the, the more participants you have, the better, of course. And then, of course, there are some inherent caveats of the direct method, which is based on self-reporting. For example, if you take fluency, uh, well, you can't, you can't really lie about your age, I guess, although maybe, I don't know, someone did it, but um, with self-reported fluency, maybe some people tend to overshoot or, uh, or then maybe say, okay, I'm not that fluent, but when, when in fact they can speak really good Cornish and there's no way to check it. And I also mentioned behavior, for example, what you do in certain situations. This is also very tricky in self-reported uh, uh, studies because there's no way for the researcher to really check that. They can, for example, I can say I really speak the language uh, at home, but there's no way for the researcher to check if this is true. Uh, then I mentioned the scale, uh, the four scale points on the scale, which is really bad for statistics, do not recommend. And then of course, there's a limited comparability to other studies because I found that um, there may have been some positive bias in the participants of the study, because if you think about it, um, people who go to the lengths of joining Facebook groups that, that celebrate the language are inherently sort of um, inherently have a positive attitude towards it. Uh, and it, it's really nice to see, but um, well, I mean, it may have been a little positively biased. So what I would use for next time and what I would recommend other researchers to use is a similar approach, but maybe with a different sampling method to make it more scientific. And two things that I also um, did not include in, in, the, in the study um, was the Cornish diaspora because I sort of aimed, uh, it turns out that some of the, some of the respondents do uh, reside outside of Cornwall, uh, but maybe I would have liked to make some provision for it in the, in the questionnaire itself so that people could come, so, so that uh, maybe in the results one could compare whether and see whether there is some kind of difference. And then I also neglected, unfortunately, Cornu English. So um, I assumed, well, this was, this was pointed out to me in, uh, by one of the participants that I assumed a strict dichotomy between English and Cornish while uh, neglecting, for example, um, the smooth continuum that is, for example, English, Cornu English, and then Cornish, um, which may be another thing to look out for next time. I mean, still, there's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot to be improved on. And I just hope that this is some kind of uh, beginning maybe for future studies. And I would like to leave you with a quotation by one of the participants, which really, really resonates with me. And I really get goose flesh every time I read it because they say, I'm bad at learning languages, but I was determined to learn Karnoic because I couldn't leave it to others to preserve my culture. And I think it is a really strong um, testimony that, um, that says that the, the language is still alive and active. And well, this conference is one of the events that uh, definitely prove it. Um, and with that, I will leave you with my references, a selection, and then I'm open to any questions, remarks, comments, and I'll well, thank you again for letting me participate. Maras. Well, uh, first of all, it was Hungary. Uh, we are still in Central Europe with the other presentation. And whereas the Ordenian ski and Strachan Spasma, the Disquade Seuanso or Huitrans, and Lowenovi, Devorsi, Marta. Thank you very much 
to, to the organizers of SCIANS uh, for the opportunity that they gave me to, to present some of the results of my, my investigation. And I'm happy to be here again and again online. Now that I could go to Cornwall, I have to do it online again, but that's life. Well, uh, I believe I am not discovering anything when I said that, the, that education has a main role in the revitalization of minority languages. Uh, this has been stated by a number of scholars and organizations such as UNESCO, which labels uh, education as an essential factor in language maintenance. And it is also described as the most obvious relevant aspect in language revitalization. In fact, according to recent research, uh, language learning among children has proved to be effective even when the target language does not play any relevant role in society. As we can see in some countries that children learn English or French and they're in the middle of Russia, so but, but they do. In fact, when discussing the matter with the language officer in Trevino in Spain, he told me that the main actor in the revitalization of Basque in, the, in that region has been education in Basque or to the medium of Basque. Now, uh, let me introduce you a little bit about the situation of Trevino. I spoke about this some years ago, but just to review. Uh, Trevino in Clavea is a small region in the north of Spain. It is not a part of the Basque country, uh, but it is listed as a Castilian region, just like, for example, Cornwall, in theory, is an English county. Uh, I don't know if you can see or oh, no. Well, uh, in the red circle, there is a red spot, that is Trevino. In the other map on the right, uh, you have the Basque Country, Castile and, and Navarra. Uh, the green part is the Basque-speaking uh, Basque regions, and the rest is Spanish-speaking. So Trevino is in the Spanish-speaking part. Uh, Nevertheless, it has been a Basque speaking region for centuries until approximately the beginning of the 1800s, when the language was totally substituted by Spanish. Uh, but during the 1980s or so, due to several circumstances, the inhabitants of the region decided to start a language revitalization strongly focused on education. By that time, there were no Basque speakers and the government of Castile was opposed to that project and did not and still does not provide any funds to support Basque education. In fact, it's interesting because the Castilian government has set a, a school in the area where students still attend classes to the medium of Spanish, evident, but also in English. It's a bilingual school, English, Spanish, but there is no Basque. Uh, the solution for that well, parents decided to, to send their children to study to Araba in the Basque country. And with the help of the local councils, they decided to set up their own school and Icastola, which is a school to the medium of Basque. Um, now in Trevino, what is the situation with the students? If you see on the left uh, about three out of four students go to study to the Basque country because they can, they can do it in Basque and only 25% only in primary and preschool uh, study in, in Trevino. A few of them may go to Castile to study through the medium of Spanish, but the number is not, not that high. And of those 25% who study in Trevino, about Half of them study in the bilingual Spanish English school, and half of them study to the medium of Basque. And obviously, the very small children go to the kindergarten where they study or they play or whatever uh, in Basque and in Spanish. Um, what is the, the result of this? If you see, I said that in the mm, approximately 1980s, 
it is when the, the project of revitalization started, there were no speakers. Uh, in 2002, there were approximately 300 speakers, which is like 18% of the population. And in the last uh, study that was ca carried out in 2012, 2011, there were already 900 speakers, which is almost half of the population of the, of the area. And since there is no possibility to prepare uh, Basque teachers in Castile, where Trevino is, the Icastola highest qualified teachers from the Basque country. The same is applicable to the production of material to teach Basque or to teach through the medium of Basque, like in uh, Icastola, uh, that um, they cannot produce its own material and the government of Castile, again, which is the responsible of education in the area, does not produce any. So what do they do? They take it from the Basque country, which follows more or less the same curricula. And as we can see, the results are very promising, very interesting, from zero to 900, from 0% 0 to 42, 45%, which is probably higher now in 2020. And now, what about Cornwall? So uh, if education plays such an important role in the revitalization of languages, the, the obvious question is, how is Cornish doing in this regard? Well, I don't want to start a long, gloomy and catastrophistic speech because we all know that the situation is not really good. Um, Kensa has already made an excellent review of the history of Cornish in, in education. So I'm just reviewing a, a few points. So as you can see in, well, first of all, I should say that it may have changed a little bit uh, from when I got the data to now, but not that much to be substantial. So in preschool education, as far as I know, the only place where children study in Cornish is, is called the Southern Kernewek in Cambon. Primary education, I have only found Penzance Primary School, although some other schools obviously may have been offering some extracurricular activities or so. Secondary education, I found nothing. Uh, although, again, there may be some schools offering extracurricular uh, activities. Higher education, it is not possible to study Cornish in higher education or to study in Cornish or through the medium of Cornish. Although Fontienne's students or Kernewek, et cetera, offer some postgraduate supervision on topics related to Cornwall, which includes obviously the language. And I found that in Cornwall College, uh, there was one short course on Cornish language, but which is not credited. Probably the most important change is when in three years ago, the Welsh Joint Education Committee started to offer uh, an entry-level qualification in Cornish for the inhabit inhabitants of what is officially England, which obviously includes Cornwall. But um, how, to, how to do this thing of putting Cornish in education is not so easy. We have that Cornish departed from a similar situation as the one that I described in Trevino, namely indifference by the English and British authorities, lack of cultural autonomy of Cornwall, and a very small or rather small Cornish speaking body. Uh, most of them second language uh, speakers. Nowadays, the situation has improved a little, but still most people in Cornwall are English monolinguals, and most of those with some skills in Cornish are not really fluent. For this, the acquisition of Cornish by children uh, cannot be solely entrusted to, to the families. As in Trevino, education must play an important role in the creation of a new generation of speakers. So in view, in view of this, the question is, what could be the most effective way to introduce Cornish 
into education. And the answer is not in any of us, or scholars or language officers or so, but, but really emanates from the population of Cornwall, who are those who may send their children to study Cornish, and especially who are those who will be paying taxes to, to fund uh, education in Cornish. For this reason, in my research, uh, I included some, some questions that were answered by Cornish speakers, national, uh, Cornish national who are not Cornish speakers, and also people who live in Cornwall who cannot speak Cornish and who do not consider themselves uh, Cornish. And the first question was, do you support the use of Cornish in education? So you see um, basically two different worlds. Obviously, Cornish speakers are mostly on, on the lines of strongly agree and agree, but those who do not consider themselves Cornish, who are approximately 66% of the population of Cornwall, are not so happy about it. However, we have like almost mm, 23 plus four, almost one in three that could agree to, to have Cornish in education, which is, which is a, quite a positive approach. The next question that I want to discuss is the perception of education in Cornish. Um, many people may think that, oh yeah, children study Cornish because I have a neighbor, a friend, whatever, but how do people see that? And the first thing that is interesting, if you see on the left, is that 50%, half of the non-Cornish uh, nationals who cannot speak Cornish have no idea at all. Something similar happens with those with Cornish nationality. 39% have no idea about education in Cornish. Uh, and obviously, uh, rather few Cornish speakers are in that, in that group. But what is interesting is that of those who say to be aware of education in Cornish, very few uh, agree that the offer is good, that the availability is, is good, that there are enough courses, that children can study or you can study at university. Most people find that there is not much uh, to choose about it. Um, now, when participants were offered uh, some concrete possibilities on how the authorities could introduce Cornish in education and how therefore the availability could be to learn the language could be better, the results may be a little bit contradictory. If you see here, uh, the first mm, proposal was to transform the regular schools into bilingual schools, Cornish English bilingual schools. If you see, uh, even most of the Cornish speakers did not agree to that. Uh, very few Cornish nationals and even fewer uh, non-Cornish nationals. Despite that, mm, as we had seen in the previous one, they believe that there is not enough uh, offer to, to, learn, to learn Cornish. So if this is not good, what can we do? Uh, what about offering Cornish as a core school subject? I mean, Cornish for all. Mm, you see, support of Cornish as a school subject, just like children learn French or any other languages. So we see that although half of the Cornish speakers state that they are in favor of this proposal, most Cornish nationals, like 60%, and most non-Cornish national, like 83%, show their rejection to this point. This, however, does not mean a total rejection. One of the, of the participants told me that, that she had nothing against promoting Cornish as a choice in schools which may be an indication of the appropriate policy to follow regarding this point. 
Now there is another point. Especially in the 19th century, some scholars stated that if children learned a minority language, they could not acquire enough competence in English, which in turn would interfere in their careers. In order to explore whether this idea may be behind the rejection to the introduction of Cornish at school, the next question requested how much the respondents agreed with the statement, if children study Cornish, they will never learn English properly. And good news, because all three groups thought that that is stupid, basically. Uh, even uh, those who had not, who do not identify themselves with Cornish or with the Cornish nationality, you see only 11% of them said that it may be a reason or it may be true. The rest thought that, that it is, it's not, it's not true. And another reason for the rejection of Cornish in education by many may be found in the lack of use that students may make of Cornish, both, both internationally and locally, uh, in the same city, in, in the same village. Therefore, the next question required the respondents to state uh, how much they agree with the statement that French or German should be learned instead of Cornish. As you see, two thirds of the Cornish speakers maintain that Cornish should be learned first. The point of view of those who cannot speak Cornish is also clear, but half of the Cornish nationals and three quarters, uh, no, two thirds of those with no Cornish nationality are clearly in favor of learning any other language like French or German, for example. However, which is also positive, there is about 39% of the Cornish nationals who prefer learning Cornish instead of another language. So in view of this, what is the most appropriate way to proceed? Uh, as we said, intravenue education to the medium of Basque and teaching the Basque language at school uh, is identified as a key factor or key actor of the success of the promotion of the language, especially among the youngest generations. We have seen that the local councils there and the speakers support Basque at school by helping both the Castola, the Basque school, and the kindergarten. Despite the lack of funds, which is that I have to underline that, another support from the regional and national authorities. Since in Cornwall, as we have said, most of the people are English monolinguals and only a minority of those who, who have some skills in Cornish are fluent speakers, Cornish has to be taught at school, as happens in Trevino. There, to be true, there is no other way. However, before this can be implemented, two initial issues need to be considered, which is what we see here. On the left, we have the first one, teachers. It's very easy to say that we want education in Cornish, but who is gonna teach? So promoting education obviously requires uh, the preparation of educators who are able to teach the, the language or even to teach other subjects in Cornish like mathematics or whatever. Therefore, it could be necessary, one, to equip already qualified teachers to teach Cornish with the required skills. Those, I mean, teachers who already know Cornish and two, to design programs or modules at university to help students to become uh, Cornish teachers. And now we have teachers, but how are they going to teach? We have in the other column, material. Uh, we need uh, preparation of appropriate material, like, because Cornish being a language spoken only in Cornwall cannot depend, for example, on material, pre material prepared in other countries or regions. Moreover, teaching a language at school requires specific material which may be substantially different from the books and courses prepared for evening classes or for independent learners, uh, I don't know, yes and wedding. However, this does not mean that Cornish education specialists are totally on their own, since many ideas could be extracted from material prepared from 
for other languages promoted in, in similar circumstances, such as we have seen Basque or Welsh or Manx Gaelic, or we have seen also uh, Irish Gaelic in Northern Ireland. Nevertheless, none of these proposals can be successful if the Cornish language is not in use in the school to a certain extent. For example, it seems logical to assume that very few university students could be willing to be enrolled in a module to become a Cornish teacher if they do not see that it may be used in the future. Equally unsuccessful could be the creation of material for school children if the language were, were not to be studied at school. No, nobody could, would want to, to make a book that is not going to be used. So these points, uh, therefore, should run parallel with the actual promotion of the language in, in the school. And this must be done according to a carefully planned strategy in order to be successful and to prevent uh, being considered an imposition by half of the population who are not really favorable to it. In this regard, it could be advisable to proceed according to some recommendations like the ones we see in this slide. The first one, avoiding maximalist or even intermediate goals on the short term. Since most of the participants in, in my research, including many Cornish speakers, do not see the introduction of a compulsory Cornish language school subject as convenient or, or the creation of uh, bilingual schools, um, we, we must be very careful. However, we have seen that even if the majority were favorable to this measure, there could be a several basic deficiencies such as the aforementioned lack of teachers and material, which would make this impossible. Uh, we have in the second point, introducing Cornish as an optional subject in a number of schools. Cornish must be introduced as an optional regular school subject according to an approved official curriculum. It should be offered during the regular class time as an alternative to other similar subjects, such as a second or even third language, or maybe some other activities. Uh, the next point that we have is continuing the organization of Cornish language school activities. Since the promotion of Cornish at, at school as, as a regular subject must be done gradually, it would be necessary to produce enough material to prepare enough teachers and to make such measures uh, known to, to other parents and to other students. For these reasons, um, we must be clear, it may take years until a considerable number of schools may be able to offer Cornish. In the meantime, all these schools must have the possibility of having special sessions or even extracurricular activities related to the language. The material for learning Cornish must also be available to these centers and, and parents must be informed of the possibilities uh, for their children to learn Cornish. Parents must also have the possibility to, to request classes for their children and the schools in turn should contact the authorities in order to be able to fulfill the parents' demands as much as possible. Obviously, uh, nobody can make any miracle about that. And after seeing the successful example of Trevino in resurrecting literally the Basque language, mostly through the medium of education, I hope that the results of this investigation may help put Cornish in the place that all the languages deserve in a place where all the inhabitants of Cornwall may have the opportunity of the option to learn Cornish so that they may choose or not choose to use it later. And well, uh, reached to this point, I can only add Marastahui. And uh, if you have any question, here I am.